Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the February meeting of the uh, Cow Catcher Division. Uh, we've got a good program today. It's going to be, we're going to have a great program on railroad signs that uh, Dwayne's going to conduct. <clears throat> and as usual, I want to thank the Texas Western for letting us uh, meet here. And David, do you have a few things you want to say? I do. Thank you, Dick. <clears throat> First of all, welcome to the Texas Western. We're glad you're here. How many are here for the first time? Great, it's good to have you here. This is the home of the Texas Western Model Railroad Club. Many of you have already received this flyer. I was passing it out earlier before the meeting. This is about scale trains and their national tour all over the United States. They have chosen our club as one of their stops. So they will be here on March the 6th and they will start at 6 p.m. They're going to talk about scale trains, their product lines. Uh, they have some giveaways. So anyway, it's really kind of a sales program that they're that they're doing to make people more aware of who and what scale trains is all about. This is open to the public. So if you can come that night, come and join us. If you have friends and other clubs that are interested in model railroading. Give them a flyer, let them know about it. If you did not get a flyer or you'd like some extras, I'll put these here on the table. Please grab as many as you want before the meeting's over with. Next thing, on the back table, sir. Uh, I'd like to add about scale trains there. They just attended some big show back east and they've had some problems and they've got a current video on YouTube uh -huh. about how they solved the problem. Okay. It's really good. It shows their attitude. They're, you know, they're trying to make, a, they are making a premium product. So you might want to look at that current video on uh, YouTube they put out. It's okay, really good. good. On the, <laughs> on the work table back there, there's a whole bunch of model railroaders and a bunch of other different craft magazines, model railroad craftsmen. Those are free. Those were donated. So take as many as you want today before you leave. Uh, otherwise, the club has already gotten what they wanted, so the next stop for all those magazines is in the dumpster. So take as many as you want. <clears throat> Last thing, <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever taken time to look at our plaques on the wall over here. We have what we've had for years called an Engineer's Award, Engineer of the Year Award. This is awarded to the member of the club that has done the most to help the club develop, including membership teaching coaching working on the lab that's engineer of the year then a couple of years ago the board of directors developed an award called the conductor award this award is specifically for somebody that's made the, the biggest impact on the layout this past year our engineer of the year was clarence zinc our outgoing coo and the Conductor of the year was Jay Waters for his work building the General Motors plant. This year, not to be outdone, I decided to invent a President's Award. The President's Award is for someone that has had years and years of service and dedication in the club. This year, it was awarded to Mr. Jerry Fussell, sitting right there. <laughs> This, the President's Award won't necessarily be an annual award. It's based on what the President CEO thinks in terms of members, how long they've served, their contributions. So it may not be awarded every year. There could be two people per year, but it's a very special award, a very elite award. So if you'll notice, Jerry's name is on this plaque, along with a member that we lost about two years ago, Ken Marcou who built many, many, many structures. If you look at Houston, he built all of that. And there's still more in the structure room that he built. So we wanted to honor these two men for their contributions. And since Jerry has been a longtime member of Division I, I thought it was appropriate today to recognize him for what he's done, not only for Texas Western, but for the division. So again, Jerry, thank you. Thank you, David. You're welcome, Dick. I want to thank um, all the volunteers that helped out at the Plano train show. 
Uh, the, from an attendance standpoint, the show was quite a success. I don't have the final numbers yet, but when I get them, I'll certainly share with, with you uh, the numbers. It appears that we, I know for sure we picked up one or two, one person for Division One, and probably a couple from Division Three, as far as new NMRA members. And when Mike Ross gets here, he'll give us a, a uh, more complete report on that. A um, couple of reminders for everyone. Um, a lot of us have um, are wearing NMRA shirts or Texas Express shirts. Those come to us through, we, you can buy those through Daylight Sales. And if you purchase a shirt there, the uh, Cowcatcher Division gets a kickback on that. So I would encourage you to go to the website. They got a lot of neat stuff there. Coffee cups, hats, shirts, things like that. T-shirts, long sleeve and short sleeve polos. So I would suggest, um, I would encourage everyone to go to that to buy some merchandise if they, if they need shirts or whatever. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out, and this is kind of a benefit of membership, um, and I used it a couple of weeks ago. I bought a bunch of uh, product from Showcase Miniatures, which is a, 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 a supply manufacturer in uh, Alabama. They make telephone, they make a wide variety of things. But I used my um, NMRA partnership program discount on that, and it saved me a pretty large, pretty good amount of money. So I would encourage you to as NMRA members use that partnership program to uh, offset part of your membership costs. Um, I also want to recognize David Crumpton one, again for his, uh, his railroad is in the um, NMRA magazine this month. So if you get, you know, if you don't get the published copy, the paper copy, and you get the digital copy, please look at it. And it's a great railroad, great articles. And then also I want to recognize other members of the group here that have been on the, in that magazine. And that includes Jim Packard and his railroad, the Never, Never Done Railroad, uh, Dr. Mike Ross in the Virginian, Lori Paletti for the Black Bear and Bayou Railroad, they're all been in that magazine in the last couple of months. So please go go check it, look it over. Um, our membership, um, have, they have a lot of great layouts there. Okay, from a regional standpoint, um, the LSR has, has decided or has set a uh, regional convention for 2024, and that's going to be in the Houston area in February. And also, of course, we have the um, 2023 Texas Express coming up at Gaylord, the National Convention at the Gaylord, Texas. And Joe, do you want to say a few things about that? If I may. And, and actually, folks, I need everybody's help if you would be so kind. Uh, like many people in this room, I'm part of the convention committee. I'm also the uh, <coughs> chairman for the Lone Star Region conventions department and conventions are all about you so i need your help if you could tell me what you expect to get out of these model railroad conventions anybody when you walk in the door what kind of an experience do you expect to have fellowship fellowship you yeah, also excuse my penmanship Knowledge from the clinics. Yeah, learning experience from the mm -hmm. clinics. Yeah. Clinics. Ed education. Someone said information. Say so again? Someone said information. 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 Ideas. Different vendors. Different menus? Vendors. 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 Layout tours. 
Contest room. Bingo. We're waiting for somebody to say. Bingo. 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 We have a winner. <laughs> You're an MMR, you can't talk. Oh, yes, I can. That's how I keep my skills up. <clears throat> what else would you want to experience when you go to a convention? Anything else? Being national <clears throat> scope, you'd hope to see some of the big names. Uh, big, there's going to be big speakers and presenters yeah. and such as that. That'd be, that'd be a well of celebrities. Hey. <laughs> wow. We have one here every every month. Now, now wait a minute. We have that right in this room here, don't we? Yeah. Look around you. All right. Well, I'd want to see the area on nice bus tours at fancy places like museums and <laughs> That's because I'm in charge of that part of the business. <laughs> <laughs> hey, put the plug in where you so, can, right? <laughs> Amen to that. With respect to what you're requesting, also, is there, they, are there venues for the lives that come? You know, yeah. There's be stuff like that. Oh, in Santa Fe, they always have a bunch of stuff for the lives to tour because you know, not all of them want to get in there and play the train. Okay, so I'll tell you what, we're going to qualify that as special guests. Okay? <laughs> You'll have to take that up with him. <laughs> okay. All right, so I think that, yes, sir. Yeah, I like that big name. So has anybody uh, contacted the BNSF to see, you know, they send somebody to give talks and so forth? You know, they've got a. Uh, okay. A lot of people down there that, that are uh, railroad fans, you know, from on the closet, but they're obviously a good source if you want to talk to somebody, okay, this is how we really do this, or, you know, perspective or whatever. So uh, I, I would suggest contact them, you know, they've got a PR department. Somebody can sure, well, and I tell you what, um, it's not specified here, but I'm going to just note tours rail all right and that's a lot of great information right there one more what you got yeah open this to uh to lay out people would lay out their non nmra members because they do have a little bit of a thing about well if you're not an nmar member are they going to be a part of the show gotcha <laughs> that that's a tricky one because when it comes to these conventions, a lot of it falls under the NMRA insurance. And if you're not a member of the NMRA, then it gets, you know, are they going to provide their own insurance and so forth and so on? But definitely food for thought. Well, I know, but it'd be a good thing to uh, recruit. There's probably a lot of beautiful layouts out there that they're not an NMRA member and they're not being seen. Right. And there's an excellent opportunity to recruit people to come into the NMRA so that they can show off their stuff to all of our membership without any extra work on their part. They've already done the artwork. They can come in and uh, share their their work with everybody else. Yes, Mike. Good opportunity. If, sir, if you've got a list of those people that you're, you, you're targeting and you know that are not members of the NMRA that have great layouts, if you can get that, put their names down on the list and get it to Joe, maybe we can get in touch with them. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, uh, yes, Russell. It's not open to the general public. I've got a lot of friends that are models that like to do the show. They don't want to buy rail passes. Is there a reason it's not open to the general public? Well, the train show itself the, is. No, I'm talking about that. The okay. convention itself? Actually, the convention is available to everybody. You do not need to be a member. Really? I thought you had to have a rail be a member or at least have a rail pass. This is, it is something relatively new. No, you just is, is it? Okay, you so, so I'm told it's something new. But, but yes, any Tom, Dick, or Harry can attend. You do not have to be an NMRA member. Okay, that was my misunderstanding. But I thought you had to be a member or at least have a rail pass. You know, you, everybody you, is well used to be you had to uh, and the thought process was if if you're coming it's a it's a benefit of membership to be able to come to these things and that it wasn't fair to the people who were paying for their membership every year if we let just everybody in so 
uh, but the uh, the current theory floating around is that you can't increase the congregation if you're only preaching to the choir. So that, that, that was my feeling. There are a lot of people that keep kind of what we're doing or interested in it, but they, I think there's more exposure they might want to jump into the party. Oh, absolutely, and, and that's probably part mm -hmm. of the reasoning behind it. Yes, Joe, it, it, the, the fee for the convention or the rate to get into the convention. If you're an NMRA member, you get the discount basically if you are not an NMRA member, you're going to pay a different price. That, that is correct. That's, that's, and that way anybody can come in as they want to. Yeah, yeah. And, and I tell you, for what it's worth, for the 2023 National Convention, it does cost a little bit extra for a non-member. But if you take that amount and add a little bit more to become an um, NMRA member, then you get the full right. benefits of the membership for just a few dollars more. So there's a great incentive to join the NMRA itself. Sorry? I have somebody that I know that just wants to come see the show and see what it's all about. <clears throat> what is the cost for that person to show up for one day? I don't have the numbers in front of me, but if you visit 2023texasexpress.com, there is a full listing of different types of registrations, member and non-member, and the amounts associated with them, either for the entire convention, a one-day pass, or a two-day pass. Is there a one-day pass fee, is there? Because I look for that, and for someone who just wants to come for a day, $165 is insane, particularly with paying for parking at the Gaylord. It's not $165 for one day. It, it, it's considerably less. It, when you first go into the registration menu, there are several options. You select your option. A one-day pass is one of those options. And you can select it with or without the National Train Show, depending on the day that you want to attend. So, so in review, what we're looking for is fellowship. And let's face it, people, this is one of the greatest parts of the hobby, okay? We get to meet our friends. Mm -hmm. We get to share ideas. We get to experience each other's company. Tours, rail. When you go to these conventions, you get to go to places that you and I on our own couldn't normally go to unless we were greeted by a security guard who would escort <laughs> us off property very quickly. So a very unique opportunity with these conventions. All right, clinics, an abundance of clinics covering all kinds of topics. You take the national convention and Mr. Cole will tell you back there, right, Mr. Cole? Over 200 hours of educational clinics, all right, to where you can enhance your knowledge, learn new things. Information ties right into that, okay? All kinds of information about the hobby. When you're going to these train shows, you get to learn new products from the manufacturers. Um, and again, meeting different vendors, okay, ties in with that. And some of these vendors actually put on clinics about things that they're doing. New things ties in with that. Layout tours, all right? You get an opportunity to go and visit people's layouts that you may have never known about. And they always welcome you with open arms. But here's an opportunity when you know you can knock on the door and you're not going to interfere with their lunch or dinner. Mm -hmm. All right, see all the wonderful workmanship that's out there. And uh, the contest room, a place to show off your creativity, all right, and, and, and get a critique, get merit awards, work towards your achievement program certificates, big names. Well, again, we got lots of big names here, but you know, you take the national convention, we've got people nationally recognized, they're gonna be making presentations at the, clip, at the convention itself um, and experiencing the local area. I'll tell you, Christina, who suggested that, has put a lot of effort into opportunities to visit some of the attractions that are in our own backyard and most of us probably haven't ever experienced. So here's a chance to enjoy the fellowship and visit the local area and experience what all of us have available. And we get to induce to visitors into our area as well, as well as the special guests. Again, clinics are gonna have nationally recognized names. There's always nice guest speakers. Um, a great opportunity to meet these people and learn about their model railroading history. And where do we learn and experience all of these things? Well, the next one is at your 2023 Texas Express National NMRA Convention, August 20 through 26. If you haven't registered yet, 
and you have an interest in these things, what's keeping you? Okay? You, you're not going to experience all the wonderful things that I've noted here that you expect if you don't attend the convention. And then also, as Dick has mentioned, the uh, Texas Gulf Division, Division 8, is going to have the regional convention February 14 through 17. Okay, so let's support our neighbors down in Houston area. It's both the Houston Division and the San Jack Club that's going to be promoting that convention. Casey. Is there a bar? Oh, sir? <laughs> There's plenty of bars at the Text Gaylord okay, Texas. Is there a bar? Yes, sir. And, and, and so I'll tell you what, somebody asked me about an open bar, and I guarantee you at the national convention, there will be a lot of bars that will be open. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Joe, thank you very thank much. Thank you, guys. Okay, and uh, Mike, you want to talk about the NMRA interchange program now? Yeah, also? Yeah, I do. Uh, one, of the, one of the things uh, one of the things that the NMRA has introduced that has been being worked on and developed for probably the last 10 months and it was finally introduced last month to the public is the NMRA interchange and uh, Mr. Cranda is fixing to bring it up here and you can see what what it is it's part of a platform called discord and it's a place for interchange of ideas and concepts and you're going to see in just a second how it all works out first off and by the way our own speed muller who's coming next month for the clinic was was absolutely integral in putting this whole thing together we actually saw it at the board of directors meeting in st louis the board of directors have been using it for the last six months just testing and doing things and the uh, and then we finally rolled it out to the membership at the end of last month. I would urge you to go in and uh, join it because you're going to see some opportunities here for some really amazing interchange in exchange and interchange of ideas. So if you very first thing read the rules uh, and rule number one is be kind. You know we're not here to flame people. We're not here to have bad interchange between our members. This is a a, a good positive exchange of information uh then if you look down the way there's different what well, not that not that fast okay back up <laughs> back up some there you've got a lobby how-to guides <clears throat> then the next thing is the help area i need help with so you just put a post in there go ahead and click on that one if you would and this guy this guy here is you know i'm i cannot find where i can enter my membership number unless it was already entered etc and these people will go back in here and give you helpful hints on different things. Uh, go ahead and, and go to the hangout room. There's different hangout rooms, and you can just hang out there and just talk to people uh, literally globally. Uh, go ahead and go away from a hangout room, hit back. And then you can go down and you come down, you can see the worldwide community. What's on your workbench? NMRA events, worldwide news. Then you come on down and you can see what's going on about the elections. Uh, this one, okay, so when you log in, the, the program is sophisticated enough that it will take your, your, when you log in, here's what you have to do to log in. First, you have to have a user ID and profile set up on the NMRA website. How many of you have never gone to the NMRA website and set up your profile? Yes. Okay. If you don't do that, you're not getting the full benefit of your membership because inside of that, like Dick has already talked about, there is a, a partner program that gives you discount <clears throat> codes. If you don't log in, you can't get your discount code. All right. And I will promise you that if you use those discount codes when you're ordering things from those vendors, you will more than pay for your NMRA membership annually with the discounts you save that you're, they're being offered to you. Okay, so if somebody says, well, it costs too much, not if you do it right. All right, so think about that. Now, the next thing is you can come in here and 
when you have your user ID and password set up on the NMRA uh, website, then you go into Discord and you enter the same user ID and password, it links back to the NMRA database and will automatically populate your interchange with the things that you need access to. For instance, in my case, it looks at it and you can see down here, slide on down just a little bit, is the NMRA board of directors. So I get access to that you want because it's a place where our board can ping each other and exchange ideas, right? Scroll on down, you can see information about conventions, uh, you regional conventions, and then the achievement program. And here's where you can, uh, no, yeah, I know it. The only useful thing on there. <laughs> it's a sad, sad state, isn't it? I'm telling you. Anyway, you can, and, and I would caution you because not everything you read on the internet is accurate. I know, I know, I know it's shocking, okay? But if somebody poses a question and somebody fires an answer back, I might take it with a grain of salt until I talk to our <laughs> regional guy. A Nigerian prince disagrees with you. Yeah, well, okay, that's <laughs> I'm still waiting for my check, too. I'm telling you, you know. <laughs> All right, so you can go in and ask questions about different things in the achievement program. You can go ahead and slide on down, please, sir. Uh, then you come into the basics, beginner questions, bench work, track laying, scenery, electrical, DCC, LCC, 3D printing, lasers, and the list goes on. Anything that you can possibly think of that you have a question about in this hobby, there is a place to ask it in here. All right. Then you come on down general interest. Okay. I need help modeling this, the operations lounge, prototype operations, et cetera, et cetera. Coal, lumber, tracks, club cars. British modeling, freelance, keep on going, please. Special interest groups. And you've got everything here from American Civil War to, to different things about different railroads. Here's one I see down here for the Frisco Historical. Keep on going. NRAIL, OPSIG, OPSIG events. Women in model railroading, ladies. Uh, then you can come down in here. You can look at for podcast around. Scroll on down. And then here is information on prototype railroads. So if you've got a question about something with the, the SP or the ATSF or whatever, come in here and you can ask your question. Chances are there's probably going to be somebody, Jim Ogden, that would be able to tell you the answer to that question. He is my go-to guy for anything Missouri Pacific and other things, not just MP, but Jim is a savant when it comes to that stuff. So then you come down in here and more prototype things in the Z. Now, remember what I told you about that it would automatically link to what you need access to? Well, if you look right there, the Lone Star region, our region is region number 3100. We're division one. So if you look at it, you'll see that division, welcome to 3101, division one, the cow catcher division. And this is a place where you can retrieve information and exchange information with other people in our region, not just the way that we've been doing it previous to having this as an option. So I'm thinking, Mr. Mr. Director, that yes. we'll probably start posting our meeting announcements here also. Would you? Yes, we probably will. Okay. So now you can get meeting announcements. If you if you say, I'm not getting the emails from the division, look at Discord. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no excuse for that anymore. Discord takes care of that also. All right. It also talks about uh, regional information and region news up there just above that. You can go from there. Now, my modeling, okay? So if you slide down here, stop for a second where it says Basic City in Arundel, the third one down. Our good friend from Meridian, Mississippi, uh, Gerald Mabry is head of a club over there that's got a huge layout. 
at his lo at his location. It's the Basic City in Arundel. So if you click on it, there's Gerald, and you can see that they've got they've got every information about their club on this. Hint, hint. Okay. <laughs> If you come down here and you slide on down and come all the way down to the Texas and St. Louis, right there, you just passed it, right there, there's my layout. As long as you put something, you can request of the moderator speed that your club have its own page. You send him a message, he will put it on there. If there's one post on there, it will stay forever. If there's no activity, it will wipe it out after 45 days. Okay. But I was unbelievably surprised when I started getting pings from all around the world about my layout. Hey, I saw your layout in the HON3 annual. Can't wait to see it at the convention. Hey, I like the photographs. How did you do such and such? And it, it was just an immediate interchange of information with people. Okay. Uh, if you slide on down to the next one down, come up one up there, now down one. That speeds layout. Okay. The Texas and, or well, no, what is it called? The uh, Nambia. Nambia. Yeah. Texas and Nambia Railroad. Okay. So, you know, everybody can have their own little space here and there's room for everybody. All right. Anybody have any questions about this? I, I really think this is a great tool to be able to um, disseminate information and also to get questions answered where you might not have gone to know about things. For instance, uh, I need information on the Tower 55 in 1962. Boom. Okay. So this is a, another location where you can really get that done. Questions? I can't. So believe. is it completely operational now? Oh yeah, yeah. So it's uh, it's going to roll out to the general public. It already has right been. Now. It I was released it. last month. Okay. It, it's working. It's working. Yeah. yeah. So my question Actually, is, my can you view layout? How do you attach your skirt to the? <laughs> uh, good. I'll and, and I'll answer that question if everybody wants me to answer it in public. Yes. <laughs> I, I took clothespins okay. and, and hot glued clothespins to the back side of the, oh, of, of the balance. And now when I want to put it up there, I just clip them up there. If I want to take the skirt down in between operating sessions or showcases, just unclip it, fold it up, and it's done. There's another question. Yes, sir. Question. Yes, sir. Now this side here, let's just say I want to go to BFB agent. A what? I want to know who's in that area. Yeah. Is that going to allow you to be able to maybe pick up a phone number and go visit their lab? No. I, I would think that that would be up to the person who is, uh, you asked the question? Well, the question is, is there a place on there that people can go to, if they were to go to another city and they have time there, they want to go see somebody's lab? That is not where you do that here? Yeah. On the NMRA website, there is a list of railroads that are available for, for doing that, but it's all part of the NMRA website where you log in and have the information behind the curtain, if you will. And there is a list of, of uh, what's it called? I know my, my railroad's part of it. Uh, Pike Registry. The Pike, Pike Registry, yeah. The Pike Registry. And you can then contact people that way. But it, but the, the, what you're asking for is available. It's just not right here. Okay. And it works. And it works. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. You're it's, welcome. Isn't it great to have the Western Division director here all the time? Right. Yeah. I, I feel at home here. <laughs> I can't understand why. Um, Dr. Ross. Could you talk a little bit about membership at the uh, Plano Trace House? Uh, let's see, we, we didn't sign up as many as we had in prior years. There's, uh, I think there were three new people. And uh, we're sort of working on uh, hopefully a little elevator speed journey for 
way we can promote the uh, the uh, division and NMRA a little bit more effectively. Okay. Anything else? Negative, sir. Okay. Uh, how about uh, uh, we, we have one, one member here, a new person here for the first time. Could you please stand up and introduce yourself? And... Right, I'm uh, Danny Hughes, our first meeting. I signed up at the uh, Plano uh, train show, and I'm just here to try to learn as much as I can about the. Welcome, Welcome Danny. Danny. What, 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 what uh, scale do you model it? Uh, primarily three rail O scale, but I just moved out here. We're sitting right, right next to him. So, so um, <clears throat> you just you're new to the area too? I just kind of back into the hobby for the first time in quite some time. So, well, good. Well, 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 thank you. Okay, uh, let's go on to awards and AP talk, uh -huh. Mr. Richardson, sir. All righty. Got a screen back here. Thank you. Okie dokie. We have one to give out this month. Mr. Crumpton, sir. Crumpton, sir. Yes, sir. We're gonna give you the we're gonna give you the caster or we'll push up against the wall and shoot you. All right. <laughs> Gotcha. You taking pictures or I will. Cool. Um, is David Hager here? Mr. Crumpton earned his volunteer. He earned his volunteer some time ago. Mm -hmm. Smile the camera. Sure. Smile. Okay, try it again. Okay, good. Thank you. He earned this some time ago, and we finally sat down and kind of worked through the numbers and everything. Okay, that's all in that. Yeah, sure. protected. Uh, there are several others in here who are probably in the exact same boat and just need to fill out the paperwork. Um, it is uh, it is one certificate that um, if I can sit down with either Mr. Brandon or Mr. Mackey back there, I might fill it out for some of you. Just show up here with some paperwork and just throw it in your face and say, sign it. Uh, that's been known to happen for what it's worth. Um, you guys have heard me talk about this every month. It is the number one way for you to get better at your craft, to get involved in this program. You will learn every aspect of the hobby from building and working on locomotive structures and cars and scenes and scenery, electrical, civil engineering, uh, where you're going to hand lay some of your own track, uh, as well as service to the hobby. Now, on that note, the certificate that Mr. Crumpton just earned here Volunteer is number one with a bullet by light years, the number one certificate given out, not only in the LSR, but in the NMRA as a whole, by a lot. I mean, almost two times as many as any other certificate. And a lot of it gets down to, if you're working on your, working on your master model railroad or you've got to have something out of service to the hobby, not everybody wants to run for an office and not everybody's up for writing articles and things like that. Uh, that's part of it but a lot of it is just simply the fact that a lot of you guys give a lot back to the hobby you give a lot back to the organization both here at the division at the lsr a lot of you are very heavily involved in what's coming up for the national this this summer and uh, stuff like that counts so Gary albuquerque <laughs> <laughs> snorkel he, he, he gives a lot back to very much so very much so. And there's a lot of guys in this room that, that should have it and don't. So uh, think about the times you guys have spent working on things and helping out around here and uh, put some pen to paper. If you got models you want to have judged, let us know. You bring them up. We'll find time to come by your place if it's something you can't bring here. And uh, we'll get you taken care of. So, thank okay. you, sir. Thank you, Dwight. I have an issue question. <clears throat> mm -hmm. What you got? Is it necessary to have a minimum of 32 square foot layout? work on uh, The only time that would bite you is if you're trying to go after scenery, if you're in HF. Right. If you're in N scale, you only need 18 square uh, feet yeah, of scenery? Okay, so the only thing, if you're smaller than 32 square feet, well, that would be a problem, would be scenery, and that's it. Everything else, you should, you might have enough room to work through all of it. But you can do scenery on someone else's layout. And that's, that. yeah, exactly. If you've got a buddy that's needing some scenery help, you know, you can get it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So let's uh, 
let's talk about what kind of problems you're having on your layout or with your models. Is there any, you got any questions or issues you want to talk about? David? I, I have a question. This isn't a, a problem for the study. Uh, I had ordered one of the new Rapido tank cars from Train World about last week. A uh, beautiful model, only I'll use the term uh, decal, it's really not the stamp. Uh, but it's rugged on the body of the tank car, on both sides. Uh, and I emailed Rapido, never got an answer. Uh, I put a message about it up on uh, Model Railroad Hobbyist site, trust uh, for hopefully that's a problem. Any suggestions is to, if, if I can't get through to Rapido, I mean, it's not like it's 45 degrees, but it's definitely noticeable. Uh, I emailed them again. I mean, they were very responsive to one of their RDCs that I had. One of the motors burned out, and they replaced it um, without it. I mean, this is obviously a, a quality control issue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because it's not being broken. Right. But just the, the, the model wasn't in the jig mm -hmm. squarely when the stamp came down. I'm just surprised they didn't answer you because they have been fantastic with me. That was yeah. about 18 months ago. They, I, 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 I called them on a couple things, things or emailed them on a couple things, things. and they've gotten got a response, response within two or three days. Okay. Consistent. Uh, right. Mike? Uh, 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 Mike? No, not on the end. It's on the side. Yeah, I've heard almost invariably the reporting marks at the ends where they have like UTLX. All yeah, no, the surprising, I, that's where I thought it would be a problem. It's not there. It's over the trucks. You've got on, on one side, I don't know if it's the B side, but the one side, you've got the reporting marks. This is on the other side, where he says, um, uh, re, re weighed or re-inspected the date, et cetera. And I mean, you can see it, it slopes down. And it's the same thing on both sides of the car. So, all right, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll email them again. So, and people said uh, on the MRH forum, uh, they've had the same problem with other Rapido cars. Uh, a freight, not passenger, on other Rapido freight cars, where one of, again, I'm assuming, it, I don't see any decal marks, it's got to be stamped. Yeah. And it just, it's not in the jig properly, or it's not, I know it's all computer run program, it's not programmed properly or whatever. So, I mean, some of the suggestion was, look, just weather it, no six. And, and that's true, but $60 for a tank car, by God, it should be perfect. Any other questions or any of Last month, someone had a question about wiring an Atlas frog, which they couldn't solder. Is that their system? No, that was David Grind. He was David Grind. Because there, on um, on MRH back in March of 2019, there was a solution to that, so I wanted to give that to him to put here. But it's uh, soldering paste, and there's an Amazon site that tells you how to order it. So okay, he'll be here next month. Okay, Mike. There are a question. Uh, I'm about to model a whole wood loading facility, and I assume maybe someone here would know. I assume the logs are cut to five foot intervals. Five foot lengths. When you load pulpwood, the pulpwood logs are the are they stripped of bark first, or are they is the bark on the log when it bark still on the log? Yeah, it's okay. stripped of So that tells me what color I have to use. Okay. Any other questions? I've got one. Long wire that I got from Titchy. Jerry Hustle and I had a discussion last night at our business meeting about the problem I'm having is I washed the phosphor bronze wire really well with, with Dawn and let it dry off real good to get any oils off. Then I've been spraying it with automotive primer by Rust-Oleum. Then I hit it with Rust-Oleum camouflage. Now in some times, some places, uh, when you make a bend or if you're just not careful, you can scratch the the camouflage, the rust oleum camouflage off, it's like it's not sticking to the primer very well. So Jerry's suggestion was don't prime it, just hit it with the rust oleum color and see if that'll help stick. And he also said on piping, even on stuff out of factories, uh, paint's real bad about coming off of piping. 
Has anybody had any experience about painting phosphor bronze where there's a secret on what you do? Yeah, you you etching it with vinegar? Etching it with vinegar? Okay. okay. Just, Just regular apple, apple cider, cider vinegar? White vinegar. White vinegar? Okay. Would you still do use the automotive primer and then go over it with your color? Okay. Now there's a product out there called Bulldog. Okay. It's an automotive and it's actually like for plastics, that stuff that collects in the automotive world, you keep it from cracking too. Okay. Bulldog. Bulldog. Do what now? Primer is compatible. Yeah, well they're both Rust-Oleum Rust -Oleum, and they're both, you know, Rust-Oleum automotive primer gray and the other one is Rust-Oleum camouflage. So. I'm assuming uh, the, the brake lines and the airlines under flat cars. He's doing, he's taking out a long piece and then he's bending it into the short pieces. Yes. Maybe this won't stay on. What, what, about, it, what about if you paint it after you've done all the bending? Uh, it, it's possible that it, it's all underneath the flat car, so I, I could brush paint it, I guess, after the fact. Well, because if you've got all that detail down in the wood, you'd be spraying your. No, 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 before you install the paint, bend it before you install the paint. Okay. What might black black in solution that way turns black and kind of etches it to paint sticks. But if you do get a little paint flaking. Never yeah, okay. Thank you, guys. Now, somebody mentioned using a Detail Associates wire set. Nothing wrong with that. However, if you're trying to get this thing judged for the AP, if you're making it yourself, it's a scratch belt part, and you'll get more points for it. Well, Detail Associates wire, not wire set. But... Okay. Okay. Any other questions there? Okay. So, well, one more. There you go. Does anybody got a fast tracks um, stock rail jig or stock rail thing they want to get rid of? Let the man go down real quick and said that part. Oh, loan, I don't care. <laughs> I think oh, yeah. it's been well used, that little for a bag. Plug for Mike's article coming up in the February issue. In his, uh, Mike's article in model. Railroad hobbies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah in the February issue. Who, Mackie? Yeah. Okay. Next month. You want to plug it? Well, I got tips and tricks so I can do it like that. Okay. Okay, let's move to uh, show and tell. We've got a number of people that have some items up here. Gary, you want to go first? No. Last. What? <laughs> I've got to get the computer fired up. Tony Casa. Come on. I want to be first. Set the tone. Yeah. <laughs> Get a home run. Life is full down. Oh, how's everybody today? Fine, good, good. Um, I am building, uh, I've brought this up here a couple times before. Um, I'm building a 124th fine scale, that's half inch to the foot. Uh, version of the Denver Rio Grande Western C25, uh, number 375. It was a quite a unique locomotive there. Um, and so far, uh, just this put is... It, just put it down on the table. Well, I've got to do some things with it here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I will. Give me a second. Um, so far, this has been completely machined out of brass uh, by me. The only... The black parts are 3D printed. Um, I... I we purchased a, a, a um, oh gosh, what do you call it? The uh, resin printer. There you go. Thank you. Um, and then everything else has been made. The driver centers are the only things that are castings, and I actually printed them on our printer with a wax resin and sent them off and had them cast out of bronze. Um, everything else has been machined or designed and printed by me. Um, where do you want me to set it? Right there. And the the neat little thing where I where I'm at now, I've actually made. Um, if anybody's familiar with what a swing motion pilot truck is, when the front wheel of a locomotive goes around a turn or wheel sets, 
um, it actually has a mechanical part of it that helps guide the locomotive around the turn. And so I'm trying to build that into this locomotive into a scale model. So um, it's very, it, it's not that complex, but trying to design it in a scale model where it'll work and have extra room. It, it took some time, um, but it, it's all in here. It uh, works. And um, I think I said this was 65 individual pieces, just this part right here that I've, I, uh, I all handmade, including uh, some 16th inch diameter clev clevis pins I had to machine and uh, some 10,000 inch guitar string cotter pins that I made. <laughs> um, the, the end goal will be to, um, for the suspension part of it, um, I'm going to try to make the suspension work like the real thing. So I will actually have curved leaf, leaf springs like a real steam locomotive and they will actually be springs um, and it will all be linked together. Um, however, the question is, will it work? Because scaling things down like that and making it work doesn't always happen like you want it to. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. That's amazing. You want to write a paper about it? Yeah, yeah. I, I probably could use a psychiatrist right now. <laughs> Or a hammer to the head. Yeah, my. When you get ready to paint, are you going to paint a bumblebee? No. No. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Jump right on that. One. That and that one didn't even have a green boiler jacket either. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, what What year is this that you're modeling on this? Right? So there's. This engine went through several, several, several different changes throughout its life. Um, it was one of the few locomotives that actually had a three bay window cab um, very early on in the Denver Rio Grande Western. Um, had an extended smoke box, a short smoke box. There's several different side rods on the side. Um, I actually think the side rods at the end of it came off of a K28. Um, but I think the version we're going for is probably going to be the end of 39. Um, it'll be pretty much all black. The front smoke box was painted graphite. It still had the scripted out uh, lettering on the tender instead of the flying real grand like most people are used to. Um, but right now I haven't made anything that will differentiate between one year or the next. So it's kind of up in the air, but I think that's where I'm going for it. Anybody else? Very nice. I have, I have an engine with a working uh, suspension. Like yeah. Talking about. Most of the action is in the levers. And right. In the leaf spring itself, the leaf spring is not at all. And, and the lever uh, connections between the actual suspension works. And, and um, on, on that, that so, so at one, one point, point, a friend of ours had loaned us a uh, O scale K27 that had all that. Mm -hmm. And the one problem we noticed is. <laughs> If you hit to something the wrong way, one lever goes up, the other one goes down, and it'll actually force the engine off the tracks. So I'm trying to incorporate a spring of the ability for that to spring as well. So that way it does have the option to move without forcing the other wheel to do something. Because when on this locomotive, you have blind drivers in the center. So if that flange driver comes off the track and it pushes that blind driver down, you now have no control with the locomotive on the track anymore. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. The steering wheel and brake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, what was the movie Polar Express? You know, you just work yeah, the Johnson exactly, Bar and the yeah, throttle, you know, and you, yeah. uh, you can drift the locomotive. That's right. We'll be good. <laughs> a little North Pole drift. Yeah. There you go. Anybody else? <clears throat> yeah. 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 All right. Very nice. Very nice. Very good. amazing. Okay, so there's a red uh, shack. That I'll talk about during the. You're going to. That's that your, as yours? Yeah. Okay. Gary? I just need to be quite yet. No, you need this? Um, I've been busy and thought I'd give you an update where I am with uh, my layout. And. Uh, it's, I have a website that uh, I try to keep updated, 
at southernpacificlayout.com. And my daughter, uh, it's a website developer up in Seattle. And so she helped me uh, get this. It's a whole new hobby, learning how to do this. And great, you're not connected. I was connected with my phone. What's it telling me? It's the same without me. I had it before. This is great. Okay. Let's see. Why does it say that? Back on the line. Go down to the lower right and check your internet connections. The bottom on the right. One of those should be there. There you go. Got that one. Spectrum 5G. No, it's not there. No, here. No, no. You're, you're trying to do the train wire. Oh, I was using my phone for a hot spot. Oh, you can log into ours. Oh, okay. Where would you like me to be? Right there. That one? Yep. Seeing this out loud. <laughs> Probably on the screen. Well, you can't see. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. I had it connected to my phone before, and it was working perfectly. <laughs> anyway, there we go. So uh, I've been making progress. I've got all the bench work. Uh, well, ninety-five percent of the bench work done. Uh, this was the last part down along the wall. Now I had made the plans, printed them out full size and put them on the floor. And then I assembled uh, the joist to the elgar while it is on the floor. And then uh, my wife comes out and helps me put the legs up. That makes things go much faster and because I designed it ahead of time. I make sure the joists aren't where I'm going to have to have it for this. And that has really helped. So I thought I'd just give you a very quick update and I finished installing carpeting in the room. And uh, I didn't have enough carpet tiles uh, because they were from 20 years ago. They were going to go in my previous layout and never were used. And uh, the insurance company after the fire in paradise was kind enough to pay for the carpet because it was smoke damaged. You don't plan on dropping any yeah. very small pieces. <laughs> I, yeah, right. Murphy well, has it plans doesn't for have it, five <laughs> Unfortunately, the house that we bought, the room I'm working in, has got piled carpet in. I, I try to get them to change that. No, no changes allowed. Do you buy the house the way it is or go somewhere else? <laughs> anyway, so I put down some plastic mats in it. Uh, and then during uh, Barry Gates was nice enough to come over and help put the fascia supports on. And he spent a couple of hours there. And I pre drilled everything. Uh, this is for the wiring for the tortoises. Uh, and I used two positives, and I have a central negative. Uh, so I can drill them either way using a slide switch uh, that will be on the fascia. And then during the ice storm, I had lots of time. So I already had the switches made, 156 of them. Wow. So I glued all the uh, fast track uh, uh, tie strips on. There's an example up here, and um, it still took a while. It took okay. almost as long as it takes all me up again. to make the switches. This way? This way? No, Which way? Right uh, this way. Back here. So uh, it's still a lot faster than hand laying ties, that I don't have to cut the individual ties. It does take time to cut around the size if you have switches that are close together. and I typically try to make a group of two or three together if they're nearby. And so that's the box is there for the switches ready to go. And I uh, leave, will leave this on until the wood on until I'm ready to install it. And I'll just snap it off. And uh, for the uh, balance, the lighting was LED. And I wanted, I installed blocks uh, in the balance so the base night lined up and uh, so there's a picture kind of what with all the framework in and then yesterday i was able to install i uh, had a nice day the day before yesterday i painted uh, 20 sheets of masonite that were 
like what we cut and for the backdrop of the center islands. And then I started installing them. The center islands wanted to still have some wiggle in them. And uh, so did the valence because it's, uh, the valence is only supported uh, by rods coming down it's a little building and so I thought okay I will just tie everything in uh, up on top and so that seemed to work pretty well and then going across the hallway aisleway, I had uh, supports that were temporary well when I took them off I didn't wiggle so I left them on and everything's firm as can be so here's a uh, picture now of I guess the first 24 I just can't watch that. I uh, got the first. Here we go. Uh, I put blocks blocks in uh, to help support the back of the uh, uh, backdrop, and then uh, I got the first 24 feet done, and that's where I'm at on the layout. So I hope to start uh, the wiring coming out of the wall. There are is for fast clocks. Don and me, I better. Uh, wire this intersection so I can still get in there before I put the back side on for the fast clock. So I think that'll be the next thing to do. And then hopefully this week I can fix the back up. And then I'm going to wire the entire layout before I start running the track. So I'm doing that. So, where, when, when and where, yeah. Uh, it, I'm on 1926, 7th to 7th. When? Uh, 1926 and oh. Southern Pacific, 11 Asia. Anyway, welcome to look at the fast tracks. And, uh, thank you so much. Always a pleasure to share. You don't get a chance to go visit this way out. If you're taller than about 5'9, five, 5'10, five, remember to duck in some places. <laughs> <laughs> I got the scars in three yeah. <laughs> No. Now we can't get through there because I put bench work across. Well, now that the bench yeah, work is yeah. there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Gary. <laughs> okay. okay, so let's take a um, short break and we'll start back up in, let's say, 10 minutes. Okay, make sure you refreshments are back there. Feed the kitty or. Um, <clears throat> Thank you very much. <laughs> We have a carry on from show and tell, Russell. Hi, buddy. Um, going on a bit of the Black Hills layout, a lot of things on it. One of the things I'm doing is a mill, sawmill, and a lumber yard. It's going to tie in the next month, too, when we do the Alberto. Because my lumber yard actually is, has a motor that drives the sawmill across yeah. the blade. Wires are right there. So when the train passes by, I'll have a sensor Hold it up. still. We'll spin the motor. <laughs> Let me yell that. We'll spin the motor, and you'll have also the sounds. You'll be able to hear the saw blade cutting through the wood. If I can figure out a way to automate the sled with the, I'll do that too. But this is a keystone kit. It's the first time I've done where I've actually had to frame the walls up with a two by four HO scale lumber. So I've had to actually frame all these walls out. And I scratch built the the uh the blade portion. It's a dual blade, one for for three for cuts. I've got the uh, steam engine and all that plumbed in. Mm -hmm. Kind of weathered this out. Um, the roof uh, is on my uh, rusting of uh, the galvanized metal. Process of doing this, like I said, to make the paint stick better. <clears throat> this is their their. Thin piece of aluminum, but I wash them down real good with vinegar to get a bite to get all the oil off the paint. It seems to work pretty good, but it's all been framed out, trying to make it as realistic as possible. The um, part of the building is this is a Keystone kit, by the way. The other one I'm working on, I just bought a roof panel. Um, <clears throat> it's an LV, JV kit. That I'm just using the drawing. I'm scratch building the whole building and everything. This little roof part roof panel will come off, and you'll be able to see the details on the inside. I saw at the Lone Star Convention somebody had done a water tower, and they'd taken cedar sheets and made shingles. 
This has about 400 shingles on it. So let me get there and get that um, So I individually glued every one of them on here. We came back and I've got about six different colors of gray to kind of weather it. You know, I think I pretty much threw it away if it mm -hmm. was. But on the back side, y'all been in these older buildings where have uh, the ceiling tins. Well, I make ceiling tins. I just figure out a way to make ceiling tins. Which I take sheet copper, and a scribe, and a full screwdriver. And I kind of scale it all out and I'll scribe it. I use the salt food over your little detail in the middle. Then I take it to the kitchen and put it on the burner and anneal it. Do it, anneal it, do it, and then try to kind of get this antique look. The, the ridge that I did for this, I should have brought it to, is copper, it's all been anneal copper. Yeah, let's a good look let's see that on the. Hold it up there and hold yeah, it. Yeah, so we can see this. Oh, pretty good. Got the Dwayne. There we go. There you go. Oh, oh that's yeah. great. Isn't that gorgeous? Nice. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Damn. The first, the second floor is all about the ceiling to do it. I'll bring the building next week. I just didn't fall it off long way. <clears> but um, it's all going to be tied into the Adreno. I think I'm saying that right. It's literally scared the hell out of me. I'm not going to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> it really does. But I want it to, when the train passes by, the sawmill will kick off and you hear the saw cutting and that, and then there'll be a lumber rack in the lumberyard house. And I want to do some more animation, but then I'll like to do animation to the servo motor. I'm either going to have a forklift moving or something happening with the servo, I don't know yet. But anyway, this, uh, the sawmill is it's fun. I'm, I'm trying some different techniques for weathering wood. I was told one time, you're too dark. So he's dark and light and trying to get the old look. And there's the process for the, the wood staining on the, this old wood. Uh, it's probably nine layers of different processes of staining, put a material on it, sanding, mm -hmm. metal thing, I think. Uh, but the um, framing something out like this, this dimensional three by four lumber with scale. Is it's difficult, yeah. but the turn metal okay, and to this guy, you've got fire blocking the one, you've got fire blocking on one wall, but get it all framed out and you try to keep it square without a lot of warping. I've learned to use one of the problems I had, the base was kind of work. I got it all done, I kind of sprayed with water, and I laid a big weight on it, and that sit for a day. So I, you know, having a little bit of that. The same problem with the lumberyard is the lumberyard house actually framed the walls up. I've got siding and I've also got the cheer walls as well, so you get a little loose of it So, anyway, that's kind of what I got happening right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, so now we need go, we're going to go into tips and tricks and we'll start off with Dwayne and I think Mike's got a couple of tips yeah. and tricks too. So, so I want to tie into a couple of things that, for what Russell was just talking about. It's real common for us to build a building and not get it quite square. Uh, and one of the first things we check for as a judge is we start looking for gaps, we look for glue spots, and I look for square. And typically what I'll do, and I'll use my little building here as an example, is I'll come up and mm -hmm. push on the corners and see if it rocks. Now, this one I know is flat and this desk up here isn't, but the, um, the idea is to check to see if it's plumb. Now, if you're not plumb, do not get you a piece of sandpaper, grab the building, and then just start doing this with it. <laughs> because what's going to happen is you're going to put more pressure with one side of your hand than the other, and you're going to sand a tilt into your building. Take your sandpaper, preferably take some 3M spray adhesive and glue it down to a dead flat surface. Not the kitchen granite countertops or mama will have the divorce lawyer on the phone. <laughs> She's already got him on speed dial, so don't, don't, don't push her. Get you a piece of glass and 3M spray adhesive, some 220 down to that glass, and then scrub it in a circle. And that will flatten that building out real quick. And you may only need to make a pass or two. So, I mean... Literally, it's a case of one, two, three, set it down, test for, test for square, 
and and only do it just a little bit at a time because you can really get carried away and then sand out you know half of your bottom board or something if you're not real careful so that's that's number one um i was just telling russell about this for his for his roof piece up here he was talking about how he put all these on here individually um yeah you can do that uh, but it's an awful lot of work so there's a way to do it quicker um, i learned this from gil freitag many many years ago but let's say this is the piece of sheeter <laughs> first first week with the new teeth yeah um, yeah exactly so what he used was a sheet of cedar there we go english take two uh out of a cigar box and that's a real popular thing to use for roofing stuff especially in larger scales uh for roofing in ho or in i really like to use the ones they actually wrap the cigar with and the really expensive ones those are hard to get the uh, the cigar shop will give you the sheet between the layers out of the box because they really don't care the ones that they come wrapped around them they like to hold on to those because guys like to light their cigars with them so they're a little hard to come by uh you can buy them on amazon however but let's just say for sake of argument that this is your cedar sheet and the grains running vertically okay take it and split it at the width of a shake all the way across with the grain okay so now you've got a whole bunch of strips you know lay those strips down get them lined back up and take chart tape it's what they used to use to make graphs and charts and offices back before we had computers or at least computers that would fit in a single room and you take that chart tape and you lay it down across all your strips okay then you leave a blank width that's about the same width as the chart tape put down another row of chart tape space chart tape space chart tape space chart tape space and you want the chart tape sticking out past the ends okay so now when you pick this thing up you've got this almost like the top of an old roll top desk or a bread box or something like that take a pair of scissors and you're going to go chart tape blank and cut it and what you end up with then is a row of individual shingles held together with chart tape. So you take your roof piece and you come in down here, you start at the bottom and you put the chart tape down and glue that first row in place with a little bit of chart tape sticking out over either end. Then you take the next row and you glue it to the blank space of that first row of shingles and you glue that down. And you just repeat the process till it goes all the way up. Then once this is dry, you take the chart tape and peel it back mm -hmm. off. And then what you end up with is the exposed row of shingles. You're doing the same thing. You're putting down hundreds of individual wooden shingles. You're just not, not in here with a pair of negative tweezers, putting them down one at a time, which is great if you're union labor and you're paid by the hour. <laughs> if you're modeling and you're trying to get a building done sometime before you die, Go with the chart tape it'll make things a little quicker so <laughs> my two cents okay very good mike you had a tip or trick had the opportunity to attend my very first amherst <laughs> train show last month if you've never been put it on your bucket list the uh <laughs> the train show was a, a two-day train show attended by twenty-one thousand eight hundred people uh in and the train show had four buildings and nine acres of vendors trains layouts and everything uh mike ross goes to to the main two foot gauge uh in the summertime and goes up there and helps them the idaville uh number three i think if that makes sense mike they loaded it up on a flatbed and brought it down there and there was a full-blown main two two foot scale locomotive there at the train show. Uh, it was it was impressive. Uh, one of the things while I was there, <clears throat> the the folks from uh, Bollinger Ederly scale trains uh, were there. And one of the things is this is a bottle of Vetero staining liquid. Don't get wrapped up in what the bottle could be used for after the stains out of it. But, uh, VeteroSolutions.com. Uh, I bought my first bottle. Dwayne would, has been using this stuff. No. No? This, this is your this first is, bottle. This is Dwayne's first bottle, too. Okay. So the the information that the two of us have is that this stuff is the bomb. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Okay. This one is murky brown. This one is murky brown. 
They have several different flavors, uh, colors that you can <laughs> that you can get. Okay. Yes, sir. I've been using this for several months now. There's a color called <coughs> ivy green. If you're looking to stain some wood that looks like it's been very weathered and starting to get moss on it, there's also another one called swamp rot. That's a paler green that gives you a lot of the rotting wood effect. So it's good stuff. Yeah. Okay. And it lasts forever. And, and you, the name you use that like you'd use India ink or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. yeah. Same type process. V-E-T-E-R-O solutions.com. Better. <coughs> Better. I'm sorry. Do you delete it? Dilute you it? you no, can, but you don't have to. Straight it's up. just it's just alcohol and dye is what it is. Yeah. Okay. So how is that different than hunter line? It's not. I mean, same, it's just same kind of thing. Same kind of thing, exactly. Yeah. I've got a lot of the hunter line stains. I really like those. Um, they've got three or four dozen different colors. Uh, the Vetero now is up to about thirty, maybe three dozen, something like that. This is all. Um, this is is another arrow in your quiver. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. <laughs> That's all it is. Another arrow in your quiver. Oh, and they're great folks to deal with. They've got wonderful detail parts. I, I usually spend a couple of hundred dollars with them every time I go to the narrow gauge convention. So I'm, if you're watching, please come to Denver. <laughs> <laughs> I have money that needs a home. <laughs> um, but at any rate, um, but yeah, I've been looking forward to getting some of these. And when Mike <laughs> called me from the show and said he was standing there at their booth, I went, I need a bottle of stain. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yes, sir. Chris has been using that for a while and all the buildings and stuff. And the chain stuff is so interesting and stuff. Isn't it? That's why you can't be large. Yeah. You can't even buy Chris a couple of new bottles. That's the yeah. Thing. yeah. It wasn't for the fun down the track. <laughs> so, the other thing I was going to share at Tips and Tricks uh, is that um, I'm at the point now to where uh, I'm trying to put in more and more detail on my layout and uh it's time for people to start moving in and and population explosion on the layout and i was trying to figure out the best way rather than glue everybody down to put them in and and i've got i came up with a solution that allowed me if i don't like where somebody is want to change the scene or whatever that i can do that in this material this stuff is called crystalline clear museum wax okay crystalline clear museum wax you can order it on the off of the web amazon's got it that's where i got mine and it is nothing more than a wax you can see and it it comes with this little star looking thing in the top of it and you just dip it in there and you apply it to the bottom of whatever you want to stick now what this is and museums use it to put and, and make items like uh, plates and pictures and things that are in display cases in case somebody bumps it and doesn't go falling off and everything. That's what they use this for. And it's, uh, it's supposed to, um, for years, museum cure conservators have been using waxes to anchor priceless art and historical artifacts from breakage due to, and I quote, earthquakes and accidents. <laughs> Our clear museum wax is the same formulation required by professionals, not acidic, non toxic, reversible. The wax is soft and sticky and will allow flexibility in shaping various size pieces. So you can take it, make a little ball, stick whatever you want to, wherever you want to, put buildings in place with it, whatever, and it will keep them from moving around. And so this is a good tool. I've, I've been enjoying it. Yes. Does it clean up well? I mean, if you pick that thing off and you scrape the- scrape Yeah, it gets right comes right off. Yeah, yep. sure does. Yes, sir. What's the name of it again? Crystalline Clear Museum Wax. Yep. And that tub will last you and all your friends. Yeah, this is, this is a lifetime supply. Yes, sir. That's cheap. If you're, say, a figure, Mm -hmm. and leaning a little bit, will it sag and lose its, its strength and eventually your depends on how you put it on there. But, but I've I've I mean, I've it won't just really grip it, it'll, it'll kind of hold it there, but it's still flexible. Uh again, it depends Ish. on how you put it on there, but so far I've not had that problem. I mean I can stick it and the figure stays, 
and I've not had anybody fall over yet. Yeah. And if I want to put them at an angle, I would I would apply it to where the the figures like this, but the the wax is here, so it builds up a little bit here, and it's clear. You can't see it. So. We've, anyway, talked very good. Yeah, we've talked about it before. Uh, this works a lot like the uh, mortician's wax that I've talked about in the past. And I got that from either Frary or Hayden or John Olson or one of those guys, you know, well-known model railroader and photographer. And they'll, they'll use those for setting up people, take a scene and then take the people back out of it because it's not something they want to have there permanently. Exactly. Um, but yeah, they do a great job. We had a number of people back when the club was before it moved to Southside and then died. Uh, it was in the Richardson Square Mall for a number of years, and I had all my people down with essentially mortician's wax. But this stuff works the same way. I mean, you you, you can take it, put down a little ball. You can actually take it and rub their feet in it and just set them down. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. Nope. You just take it, nope. rub your feet in it, rub the feet mm -hmm. of the, the person or whatever in it, and just stick it right down. I mean, if you reach across there and you hit him, you might knock him over. Yeah. You can just pick him back up and set him right back set down. Set him right back down. Yes, sir. Oh, so what's really that Canadian outfit you got the little fish from? Oh, oh, mini I'm mini glad prints. you asked that. Mini prints. Mini prints. And, and I didn't bring it with me, mini prints at the, was just across the aisle from, from um, the NMRA booth. And while they were there, they were scanning people. I got myself scanned. Okay, so if you so choose, you too can have Mike Mackey on your layout. <laughs> or not, okay? And if you want to shoot arrows at the mini Mike Mackey, that's fine too, okay? But, but hang him up by effigy, whatever, it doesn't matter. But... Um, having perp walking into the police station. Yeah, exactly, perp walking into the police station, that's right. Um, the, uh, it, it should be... The figure of yours truly should be on mini prints. I'm thinking next week. And uh, I, I don't know what they're charging for it. Eight or 10 bucks. Probably give it away. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah, they'll pay you to take it. Yeah. Do they have to expand their website? They did. They did. Um, but Gordy got scanned. I got scanned. Um, there's a bunch of the NMRA people got scanned. Greg Riccardi got scanned. Um, a lot of folks that, that we're friends with that we know from the area, but if you want to have individual people, you can do that. Um, so I, uh, uh, feel free if you want to order some, if you want to order me, but it's, it was kind of fun to have it, have the opportunity to have yourself on your own layout. Yeah. You know, that's pretty cool. Uh, it, they charge 85 bucks for the scan. Uh, and I, uh, I get five figures of myself. For that in whatever scale I wanted. Well, it's not ready for a second one, let alone five. There you go. There you go. Okay. So, all right. Thanks. Thank you. Did you order a one to one? Yeah, there's they're on Facebook. Yeah. We show you all the new stuff that they're putting out. Like the Valentine's special is online now too. Okay, right. so they got it. If you order right now, they get uh, they will uh you know, they'll they send a couple that's out. Uh, in races for Valentine's Okay, so let's get into our program now, Dwayne. Okay. All righty. Um, we'll the, there we go. All right. We did this one back during lockdown. Yeah. And talked through, and I wanted to kind of recap some of it. Um, so, I mean, you can go from a fairly plain looking building. Come on. Oh, come on. There we go. It's something a little more dressed up. And all it takes is adding some signs. Uh, this was on the old club layout that we had, uh, that we sold here a couple of years ago. This is all done in SN3. Um, but all of those buildings were scratch built and all the signs were found online, customized and whatever. Uh, a couple of them were built from scratch. This Rockridge Trading Company here, you can actually see it on the screen, uh, has the peeling paint. That was done in Photoshop. Uh, I'm not really going to cover too much of that today. If somebody's got an interest in doing some more advanced sign work, uh, I'd be happy to do a little quickie clinic on that at some point. But 
a lot of the more advanced things are going to require you to have a copy of Photoshop. And the last time I looked, it's about seven or eight hundred bucks. So not yeah, everybody's going to want. They have uh, now about nine dollars a month uh, subscription. Yeah. You can get the okay. Yeah. So that's not too bad. Yeah. So, uh, but there are some things you can do there that you can't do in other places. So, uh, one of the things too that we did here uh, back in September of 2021 in this meeting. Uh, John Lawrence down in San Antonio did a great <clears throat> clinic on the history of signs. That's the link to it. Obviously, you're not going to be able to click on that on the screen, but if you go out and look at the Cowcatcher Division channel and go look for September of 2021, 47 minutes and 47 seconds in, he starts his clinic. And it's a really, really good one because it gives you a lot of history on how the signs really were done. Uh, now that in nowadays with computers and all the fancy fonts and all this stuff we have, we keep everybody keeps making all these signs that look old, and yeah, they didn't make them that way. Every, all the signage was really pretty plain when you start looking at signs outside painted onto a building or something like that. Uh, typically, they for the longest time they were uh, black with white block letters or the, or the opposite, white with black. And uh, sometimes they'd have a border, sometimes they'd have a double border, sometimes they'd have no border, but they were all pretty pretty primitive really from the sound of it um so i wanted to just touch base on a few things here um looking for antique advertising uh, i like to use yahoo instead of google mainly because on yahoo when i do a find on this and i drill into these i can go and right click and save those images off to my computer on google you have to go to the website and then you get to surf through the website to try to find the image uh, where this is a little more direct, but this is literally just a search for 1950s advertising images and you can go into the images section right here and it will have them all out there individually where you can go through and right click, you save as again? Yahoo. Yeah. Okay. Yep. 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 But, but yeah, go to Yahoo instead of Google. Because this is one of those cases where it's definitely better to use. Um, this is another search basically the same thing just gone into the image section you can see how they've got them all lined out and you can you can actually get specific if you're doing signs for a uh, a soda fountain and you want to find coke signs pepsi signs dr pepper whatever you can actually search for soda signs you can actually go by brand name uh, you can find brands that have not existed in almost 100 years uh, and some of them not exactly politically correct um, <clears throat> But there's a ton of options. You can search for billboards and use actual billboards. They're easy to mess with once you get them. I'll show you how to do a little bit of that. So when I got into this one, uh, when we talked about this the first time, we took this image and we worked through a few different things. I'm going to skip past this because we've talked about it before, but I'm going to show you a few things on playing with some signs. Uh, one thing I will tell you, when you start doing this, um, clear your calendar. <laughs> because you're going down the rabbit hole and you're it's one of those you're going to start working on it you know right after lunch or whatever and then pretty soon the wife's coming in going you know it's 10 30 at night you haven't eaten yet you think about eating anything before you go to bed um but do yourself a favor and start organizing them make file folders this is a quick screenshot of my file folder structure out here so i've got file folders for alcohol and tobacco uh stuff for bathrooms calendars Cars and trucks, celebrities, clothing, foods, gas and oil, groceries, which wants to go with foods, uh, home stuff, uh, humor, so they're kind of funny signs, uh, hunting and fishing, uh, and so on and so on. I mean, I've got stuff right down to tractors and farming. So there's anything you could think of to help you organize it and find them later, make a folder, drop it in it. Uh, this will make coming back and looking for things later on so much easier uh let's see here so this is where we started working through the signs i'm gonna cover that a little different live and the other biggie that we didn't really cover uh, that we covered in this that i'm glossing over is print them on a laser printer if you don't have one take it down to office depot or kinko's or something like that and have them printed on the laser because if you want to do any wet weathering uh, if you did it with an inkjet, all you're going to do is activate the paint and it's going to ruin the side. Um, but can you tell it first? You can, but it doesn't. Mm, you can. <laughs> um, give you an idea of this one right here. I actually built this one in uh, PowerPoint 
I'm going to talk a little bit about that. <coughs> well. uh, so we'll skip past that because we're going to do a similar demo. This is the peel paint that I was talking about before. Uh, it really looks great in the bigger scales, but HO and smaller, it's almost so small you can't really see it, unfortunately. Um, that was a sign that was hanging in a place called the Pizza Ranch up in Liberty, Missouri. And uh, I kind of wigged out the store manager a little bit because it was hanging in the spot where you're standing in line waiting to order. And uh, I ran around the corner, grabbed a chair, drug it back over there where we were standing in line, Stood, got the chair where I wanted it, stood up on the chair, and I'm taking a picture. The store manager comes up and says, can I help you? And I said, only if you can raise me about six inches higher. <laughs> and uh, got the picture, and then we uh, used it for the sign of the blacksmith shop. So then I had to explain to him, I'm one of those crazy model railroaders, and this is about to become a building sign. That explains a lot. When doesn't you know it, though? Crazy model yeah, exactly. It, it really covers a lot of sins, doesn't it? So you can find all kinds of different signs, uh, different eras. I mean, this, while it looks newer, is actually an older sign than that one because of the bottle shape. So if you want to really get down to some specifics, uh, the advertising that you have on your signage, the types of advertising, uh, license plates on your cars, things like that can really help define the era that you're modeling. Um, if you are psychotic and go down to license plates, there is a website out there and I don't have it in this deck and I don't know it off the top of my head, but if you do a little web search, you can find it. Uh, if you have a custom hot rod, they have old vintage new you know leftover stock and you can order valid issue plates from them so like i have a friend of mine that has well i think he sold it now but he had a 66 or a 69 chevelle he ordered a set of 69 texas plates that you go through and you pay the price and it's not cheap but you get a valid legal set of 69 tags for your car um, the neat part about this one particular website that I found is you can specify your state, specify the year, and then if you want them custom, so it can say Gramps on it if you want to, you can type it out and it will give you a preview, which means every one of your cards can have individual license plates, <laughs> as long as you're willing to spend the time and, the money. and you're nuts. No, you don't have to do, spend any money at all. I mean, in this, in this case, you pull up the preview of it, do a screen capture of it, drop it in the software, and scale it down to size. I don't know off the top of my head. I'd, you'd have to, I'd have to do a web search to see if we could find it. It's been so long since I've used it. But I've got tags for uh, 50, 1956 and 1957 for Colorado, all the surrounding states, Texas and Missouri. Uh, and I'm thinking now I'm going to move the railroad to September of 58 instead because... Okay, I'm going to play guitar on the side. I build them. Uh, in 58, Gibson released the first of the bursts, and they released the Flying V and the Explorers. And I've got a guitar shop I want to name after a friend of mine that passed away uh, not too long ago. And I want to put some bursts and some Vs and stuff like that in it. And uh, that's not going to be right in 1957. So I'm willing to fudge a lot of things when it comes to making my own railroad. But my, as uh, Doc Holliday said, my hypocrisy only goes so far. <laughs> Uh, porcelain signs, do a search on the on the web for those. You can find them all over the place. There's all kinds of places that make reproductions. Uh, and the, the swapping and selling of antiques is a big collector thing. And God bless them, eBay is a great source for a lot of these pictures. Uh, the nice part about going for antiques is they're already dusty, dirty. Some of them have bullet holes in them. Some of them have part of the porcelain chipped off. And it saves you all the weathering. Just print them and mount them, and you're done. Uh, and they like to take really nice, good, outdoor, good light, head-on photographs of them for when they're selling them. So there's not a lot of correction that you've got to do to them and stuff like that either. Uh, the nice part about some of the reproductions is not only do they have signs, they've got the old thermometers like would hang by the door. You can take those and scale those down and print them off, and they look great hanging on the side of a building. These are a few signs, a few places you can find those. Uh, GarageArtSigns.com. The motorbookstore.com pin signs or mostly signs.com uh, those are just three of various ones out there but you can and even that's a couple of three years old so i'm sure there's several others and maybe one of those might be dead by now who knows um but i will close this one out with a couple of pretty neat old pictures and look at all the signage on that and you're about to see it get a whole lot busier there's a drill in at the gas station look at all the signage on this one they're on the pumps they're on the 
sale sign, cars wash 95 cents. They got the Texaco. I mean, they're just all over the place. That's the same one we saw a minute ago, but now it's zoomed out from across the street. And look, the entire side of that building, that is three and a half, four stories high. So you figure a story's marginally, what, about 11 feet, something like that? So this whole sign right here is about 35 by probably 40 or 50, as a guess. And then every row in between has got something added on to it. So there's a lot of opportunity for signage out there. All right, so we're going to skip past the end of that one, and I'm going to get you into working with some stuff. Now, I built a lot of them in PowerPoint. Uh, if we were to open one up and, and pop one out here, we can do that real quick. Um, so let's do a blank presentation. Let's get rid of this. Now, when I discovered PowerPoint, I had been using it for probably close to a decade. Uh, and then somebody asked me to teach a class. And I said, okay, like what? He goes, well, can you teach us how you made your signs for that building? I went, sure. I wonder how they do all those neat presentation things that they do. I've seen them do them in other clinics and all that. And I asked the guy and he says, well, you do it in PowerPoint. And I went, you can use PowerPoint for something besides making signs? <laughs> <laughs> turns out you can. So all you need to do with something like this is you can come in and find one of your images and let's pick something here um let's go to now these are all the various sodas that i've found and i've even got them broken up so seven up coke dr pepper mountain dew pepsi rc and then various ones okay so you oh excuse me you can come in here and let's grab emma Poor old machine is so slow. It hasn't had a coffee yet this morning. While that's spinning up, I want to talk about something else I'm going to demo here in a second. There's a company called Evan Designs, and they make model builder software. What this does is it allows you to print up, design and print up buildings and come out with stuff very similar to uh, Paper Creek, if you remember those. Uh, they're really neat. They're great for using for background models. They're really good for doing mock-ups, stuff like that. Um, Pat Harriman, who was the National AP Chairman before Dad, uh, Master Model Railroader as an architect by trade, and he really liked using that software. He turned me on to it. And I've actually got a couple of buildings off of Pat's layout when he switched from HO to ON30. It was a couple that he gave Dad. And I didn't know it until I actually got them after Dad passed that um, both of those buildings actually about half of them are model builder software. He used it to print all the siding and some of the roofing material and then mounted Grantline windows and doors in it. They look fantastic. Uh, but this software is called the Advertiser. It's an add-on piece. I, I've had this now for about five, six weeks. Uh, their, their support is great if you need it. Uh, very, very helpful. It's, I think, I think and I had them ship me the copy of the CD, but you can download it and it's a little bit cheaper. But I think even with them shipping the CD, it was like 32, 33 bucks, something like that. It's not real expensive. And we're gonna demo this one here in a second, as well as another option for playing around with signs. So if I come up here and we're gonna do a screenshot. If I can't do a straight copy, let's try copying it. See how well that works. Over here, do a paste. And then you can come in here and then add some lettering to it. And we're going to make this a little bit bigger. All right, and I'm going to add maybe, come on. I'm going to say bottled. By Fred. Just make it nice and nice and simple. Then you can take it, you can shrink this down whatever size you want. Whoop. Oh, I take that back. You gotta do it up here. Alright, so there's two ways you can play with lettering in PowerPoint. Alright. You can go up here and change the font size, and the smallest you can get is an eight-point font, which gets it down to that. But what if I want it smaller than that? I've made dimensional data decals in PowerPoint. And you can't get it small enough to do that for HO. So here's how you do it. 
So we're going to do a copy. We're going to come up here and we're going to do a paste and we're going to paste it in as artwork. Now it is no longer a font. I'll drag it over here. I will drag it over here. Then you can grab your corners right here. All right, come on, there we go. And now I can make bottle by Fred whatever size I need it to be. <laughs> so if you want it to be nice and tiny, there you go. Orange Crush, bottled by Fred. Spread it off. <clears throat> now here's here's the thing. If you want to make signs and you're going to plan on weathering them, here's what I suggest you do. We're going to grab everything and we're going to drag it over here. And we're going to do a uh, let's see, Alt D, no, it's Control D. And while it thinks about it, it's going to repeat it one of these days. You can. Uh, this actually works a little easier um, when the machine's actually freaking responding. Because um, what it will do is you can take it and you can move it over and then you hit the button again and it will repeat over however many times you keep hitting the button and they'll all be in a nice straight even little line. Where if you just control C, control V, you've got to move every one of them around. So at any rate, make several of them and then print them off. <clears throat> and I will show you some of these here. I'll, in fact, I've got a sheet I'll pass around here. And in fact, Jim, I'll hand you that and let you guys pass that one around. I like to print several of the same ones because I'm going to start weathering on them while they're still on the sheet. And then I'll find the one I like the best and then I'll cut that one out and we'll go with that one. So, okay, is that decal sheet or is that print, regular printer paper? Okay, right. Yep, plain old printer paper. Right. You can use, you can print it on decal sheet. It's just that unless you have a printer that has a ghost cartridge, you can't print in white. Why so. does it matter if you the orange crush picture? Does it matter if it's like print quality, like three hundred dpi or something? Nah, uh, a lot. So small. Yeah, a lot of the stuff that you're going to find, especially like on eBay and stuff like that, it's probably only ninety six. Yeah, but. From a print quality standpoint, because as small as we're making them, it's not that big a deal. If if you were trying to take it outside and print that off for your garden railroad, and you're trying to make a sign be about like that by that, yeah, it's going to look horrible. But for what we're doing, where we're going to shrink it down to something about maybe that big, you'll never know the difference. So now, built signs like this for years. Now, when we got the laser, uh, we started working with uh, Corel Draw. And I use this now for my signs because it's vector image. So with PowerPoint, it's not meant to be a graphics editor. I'm using it as one, but it's not really meant to be one. It's meant to make presentations and do slideshows for clinics and meetings and stuff like that. This is a graphics package. Now, it used to be you could buy CorelDRAW for about 100 bucks. Now they want to sell you the whole graphics suite. You might be able to get a subscription like he was talking about earlier, um, but it's now about $500 if you want to buy it outright. We use this to drive the laser, but again, I use this for a lot of sign work as well. So in this case, I was working on a grocery store at one point uh, for a guy, and we started looking around at signs. So there's Campbell Soups, Morton Salt, uh, Sunbeam Bread, Moxie Soda. Uh, he's from the Boston area, so I figured I'd throw a Ted Williams sign in there to suck up to the client a little bit. Uh, Heinz Pickles, and then, uh, I put a great big Jack Daniels one out there for another project I was working on. But as you can see, um, there's a bunch of them on here because I never know when I start weathering one of these, what I'm going to like, or if I'm building this for somebody else, what they're going to like. So for example, I did the signs here on this little building that go along with the uh, grain elevator that I built for, uh, for Jerry. It's gonna go on the layout over here. And Jerry told me up front and wisely so, cause he knows how I like to dirty things up we don't want it your version of dirty so i have gone very light on this and uh, in fact there's a little bit of weathering that needs to happen on the building but it really doesn't need to happen until they're ready to put it in place but i did several different versions of signage on this that i'll show on the camera here in a little bit but all of these are part of the signs that's going around on that sheet and i've got some of the leftovers i've also got a piece of clapboard here that we're going to do a little demo work on here in a minute so to give you an idea of some things you can do with the power of Corel Draw or power and or PowerPoint. Indian motorcycle, parts of service. Okay. I took this into Photoshop 
and cloned out the word Indian. There's a reason behind it. There's a method to the madness. Oh, yeah. You could actually. Didn't in this case. <laughs> what I ended up doing, though, is I brought the blank one over, or that I got that out of, out of the Photoshop. That's what we ended up with. What I ended up doing, though, was I copied that upper portion that's now blank, and then I added it to the top of the sign and added the lettering for the owner. So now it's Gifford's Indian Motorcycle Parts and Service. So you can customize these things and name them after your buddies. So in Photoshop, how did you take Indian out of there? Okay, I can show you that one real quick. Uh, it is a uh, what's called the, the clone stamp. Okay. So let's let's do this. Let's. Yeah. So you just start over again. Let's do this. Let's. Uh, ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. Let's, here real quick. let's get rid of this. Actually, better idea. Do the same way we did it a minute ago. You don't have to worry about it that way. Wayne, while you're doing that mm -hmm. in PowerPoint. To change your font size, mm -hmm. just go up in the top and type one or 0.5, and it'll make it that we'll, size. Will it go down that size? Okay. Yeah. I just checked to make sure it worked. Yeah. I, the, the uh, yeah, changing it over to the graphic just allows me to drag it and drop it, and, and I can kind of dial it in the way I want that way. But yeah, that's good to know. Because then it's still a font, and if you figure it out later on, after you got a size that, oh, great, I spelled the guy's name wrong, <laughs> and now it's still a font. You can go back here and... and uh, so I'm going to take this, I'm going to right click on my sign, and where is it? Come on. Put that one. PowerPoint. Go back to Photoshop, I mean, let's go new. The neat thing with Photoshop is whenever you copy an image and it's on your clipboard and you go select new in Photoshop, Photoshop goes, Oh, he's got this on his clipboard. Let's offer him that size first. So that when you paste this thing in place, it's already the perfect size. I said, when you paste this thing in place, it's already the perfect size. It's not pasting in place. All right. You know, so, it's been a while since I saw a crank on the side of the laptop. Yeah, no joke. <laughs> uh, Tuesday was Patch Tuesday. Yeah. And my machine has been struggling ever since. It's still trying to get all the patches downloaded. There we go. All right. So first thing I'm going to do with this is I'm going to, I'm going to select the magnification tool. And I'm going to bring this guy up here. Now, if you come over here and you select this guy that looks like the old rubber stamp, it's going to have, and you can define how big this circle is over here. I want it to be fairly small. And I want to grab part of this background and then be able to cover this up. So I'm going to come down here where it's all nice and gray. I'm going to hold down the alt key. That's going to put that little target out there. I'm going to select hit the left button on my mouse and I can come up here and just left click and hold and start dragging it. And eventually you're going to see part of that eye pop back over. Because if you'll notice, I've still got the crosshairs down here. That's the part it's grabbing, and I'm pasting it in up here. So you're just painting over. I, I thought you were nope. magically removing what no, was there. No, no. I'm literally just cloning it out. Well, there's a setting, too, where you can make your spot that you've chosen. Yep, you can make it Not bigger. Person. Yeah. Well, there's, oh, there is. Ooh, okay. Well, gee, Daryl, just throw that out there, but then not say how to do it. Yeah, no, I, I, I have, I have uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to look that one up because yeah, having having it movable is a, is a bit of a pain. Yeah, because so basically this is all I did. I just sat here. I, I was actually doing this while we got the meeting started. So you're just going back in and cloning it out. Um, obviously, I'm not being as meticulous as I was the first time, but I keep coming back over there and selecting that corner. I keep forgetting I can't go backwards. Now that I've gotten that far into it, now I can go a lot and take a much bigger bite out of it. So I can go all the way over here before I start repeating that D. Dwayne, another thing is once you get an area that big, it's actually faster to just Cut make a rectangle it. and copy and paste. Probably so. And then yeah. merge the layer. Yeah, yeah, probably not a bad idea. All right, come on. But that's how it is. Okay, got so, it. Anyway, back over here in Corel. 
So now you can actually take it if you want to play with the letter and you can drop it back into Photoshop and I can play around with fading this back out and stuff like that and getting it to where it looks a little more like the Indian sign. So I could come in here actually and tell it now that if I select this and I tell it it's going to be outlined in a yellow, uh, it's probably a little too light, it's a little too brown, do that one. And then I can come in and build another one slightly bigger and do the black outline and that way it's more or less like this, as close as I can get it. Then I can take that and drop that in as a layer in Photoshop and then fade it and stuff like that. So, I mean, you can really get pretty tricky with it if you want to. Um, so there's a couple of ways to go about doing it. Now, this is the advertiser software that I was talking about before from Evan Designs. So in here, I had this guy and let's, well, let's bring up the editor. So when I first brought this sign in, and there's a bunch of signs already built into it. I have not looked or I have not found a way yet on this one. I haven't done a whole lot of looking either, admittedly. Uh, but in the model builder software, you can bring in your own what they call textures. So you can bring in pictures of siding or roofing or whatever, and then you can use it when you're doing model builder. I think you might be able to do the same thing with the signs. I just haven't found a way to import an image yet. Uh, but there are a number of, of signs in here, and there's a whole section that are basically blank templates, and then you can color them and letter them and do whatever you want with them. Now this one, all it said originally was drugstore. And in this editor, I went back in here and changed the font a little bit to make it smaller and then named it Gowers after Old Man Gower on It's a Wonderful Life. Coke was wonderful and, and Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, um, most of the soda companies at least, were really good about coming through some little small town and finding uh, Old Miss Ruby's Diner over there. And he goes, you know, you really need a sign outside. Well, yeah, I do. I just can't afford one. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll put you a sign up outside and we'll put your lettering on it and everything that you want, but it's going to have a great big Coke sign on it too. And most of them would take them up on it for a free sign. So you'd end up with something like that that would drink Coca-Cola, whatever. And then up at the top in little bitty letters would be at Ruby's Diner kind of thing. So, but most people would take them up for it because there's a free sign and why not? So I stuck this one on here. Now, once you get your lettering in where you want it, you can, you can close out of it. Um, but all the signs that are in this, any almost all the lettering that's in them is perfectly editable. Uh, we're going to make this one a little bit bigger. We're going to try to make this one a little bit bigger. There we go. And you can copy from one picture to another picture, another page. Yeah, it's it's got all kinds of really neat stuff in here. So I can come down here, and we can take this out, and I can go in here and say. Well, how do I need to spell it, Daryl? Aha, uh -huh, okay. C O W. Okay, so that, that was a typo on my part. Whoop. Yeah, exactly. Hey, if you're going to be wanted, at least be wanted with the spell right. All right, cancel. Nope, nope, I want this one. D A R R E L L C O W L E S. Ta da! Ding, 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 ding. You can increase the letter spacing if you want to. You can actually put it on an arch if you were so inclined to do so. Um, you can change all the font colors. Any font you have loaded on your computer, you can then change it and make it into one of those. Uh, this has just got all kinds of really neat stuff. I can come down here and, you know, put the nickname down there, you know, Dastardly Daryl or whatever. Um, you can have, I, I think I might even be able to import a picture and overlay the, whoever that is and uh, pop a picture, pop them in there for, you know, and make them wanted for train robbery or whatever. Um, so there's all kinds of neat stuff you can do with this. And um, all these are then printable. Uh, I believe in talking with the guy at customer support, uh, that you can import these over into Model Builder, and uh, then you can actually include those. So if you're printing off the side of a wall, you can actually have the signs already printed on the side of the wall if you want to. So um, pretty neat stuff. And like I say, dirt cheap. I mean, I think even the Model Builder is all about the same price. So, I mean, you guys want to come up with some backdrop buildings. If you know you're not going to get to that one for 15 or 20 years, this beats the heck out of the uh, three by five tent uh, that says Acme Brick on it. You know, uh, you can do some really neat stuff with it. All right, 
So that gets down to the making of them. Let's talk about applying them. So let's move a couple things out of here. Have you got me on the camera? Little camera over here? Thank you, sir. Let me dial in where you are. Okay. Get the mouse out of the way. I, if that's the moose, I'd hate to see the cat. All right. I'm going to take, so you can do them a couple of different ways. So on this one, it's that old Coke sign that we saw before. And all I've done is I've mounted it to a piece of 164th plywood as a backer. And I've made a frame out of strip wood, just plain old strip wood. Do I care what size it is? No, not really. Do I care about the width? No. It could be two by, it could be one by, how we know. I literally turn around and go, what would make a good frame for that? And I'm looking through a box full of lumber about yay big around and pick something that I think is going to make a nice frame and build it out, frame it out. Now you can take a one with an ink jet. You asked about dull coating at first. Uh, this is one I dull coated and then did a little bit of tinkering with. It does have a pretty nice little texture to it now. Um, but you've got to get way up above it because if it gets, if it's not dry as soon as it lands, it'll get that ink wet and it'll start to reactivate the ink and it'll start floating and then it's just ruined. But that one actually turned out halfway decent. I'm kind of liking it. Now this one, the sign, the lettering is a little bit faded, but this part isn't. And that's easy enough to do with a little bit of uh, weathering material here. I've got a little bit of titanium white on this. Uh, little sponge here and so ladies if you find your uh, model railroad significant other is in there borrowing a makeup sponge don't ask for it back and don't don't give them a lot of grief about it it's all in a good cost all right so that gave it a little bit of age and got to weather it up a bit so when I've had these printed up when Jerry asked me to build that little uh, uh, feed mill over there there was enough leftover clapboard and the cutout pieces where they had laid it in the machine and cut out the walls. There were a couple of really large sections. There was enough in here I was able to build the walls for this little building. Um, and we're going to talk about a few different ways of putting signs on. So that one you can kind of sort of tell it looks like it's painted on. Those are mounted on. The roof has a standoff sign, stand it up, and then the Logo's got a bit of a painted on. Now, again, these are just faded with some a uh, little bit of titanium white. Uh, you can get in here. You can do it several different ways. You can use same like weathering powder if you can find something that's pretty close to the color of your wall. Uh, you can also take the same color that you used and make a wash and use a wash on it. But I don't. I wouldn't really recommend going that way. If you can find a, a weathering powder or a uh, past a uh, pan pastel, like what comes in these. If you can find something that's about the same shade, I would go with this route and keep it dry if possible, just because you don't create the paper starting to want to uh, warp on you or anything. So what I've got here are Purina Chows. I've got a chicken feed. I've got layer bust. I've got Purina Chows again. And I've got some of these in different sizes because I wasn't sure you know, what I was going to want. And I have hit these with a little bit of titanium white. You can see the difference there. Uh, and literally all that is is makeup sponge, open up the pan pastel, dip it a little bit, and then come in here and just do one of those. Nice and simple. Now, again, I'm never going to settle for just one when I'm working through these. So I've got a few extras here. And so let's try, try a little bit of uh, weathering powder here. Let me grab this other paper. Grab that. And that. I always work over a catch bucket. As you can see, one of my vices is cherry lightsabers. I buy them by the case because they're getting harder to find now. It wasn't like when I was a kid and you could find them at the grocery store. Every time you went to the grocery store, now they're getting to be a little difficult to find. Lifesavers. Oh, so I, I buy them by the box when I find them, and I use this as my catch box. So I'm going to take a little bit of this, tap that off, and then let's come in and Now, 
Um, normally I would do up probably the rest of that row, but since we're in a little bit of a class time here and time is of the essence, we're going to work with just this one. Now you can cut these out several different ways. And one of the reasons why I like doing the Alt D, get them all to line up, or if you're using Corel Draw, you can make them perfectly line up. You can cut them out with one of these little guys. Uh, if you find this laying around in Mama's craft room, do not cut your pizza with it. Mama will not be happy. Uh, but this, for things that are in a straight line, work really well, okay? Because you can make long, big, straight cuts with it with a straight edge. Um, a pair of scissors works really well. Uh, do not skimp when you buy scissors. Go down and buy a good pair of Fiskars. If you go to the sewing department and tell them you want the finest pair of Fiskars you can find, you're probably going to find them about this size. And these are invaluable in model railroading. If your wife does needle craft and all that, she probably already has a pair like this. Put your name on them or you'll find your scissors in her sewing stuff. Ask me how I know this. Um, I always get the, well, why are you borrowing my scissors? I'm not. I'm getting my scissors back. Well, how do you think here's all your scissors? Because I don't think you're, say, Dwayne on them. Um, did, did you actually win that conversation? I did, because I, at the time, the pair she was holding had my name on them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, it's, I, I only win one or two a year, but I won that one. All right. Yep. Now, a lot of times I will use these. I use these for cutting out decals as well. Uh, but when you really want to get into some really fine work, a good scalpel really can't be beat. Uh, just the ability to make one little slice and be done with it is uh, is really nice. I'm going to come in here with a straight edge, roll that one down, and yeah, okay. this blade's getting a little dull. One of the nice things about working with a scalpel as opposed to a regular number 11, uh, for those of us who don't like to spend any more on our hobby than we have to, uh, if you've got a leather strop, you can take this and a few times and it's right back in business. I wouldn't try to do, you know, appendectomy with it or anything like that, but uh, um, for what we're doing, yeah, rock and roll. All right, that gets us most of the sign. And then turn this bottom edge off. All right, now I can then do this a couple of different ways. I can take this sign, and if I want that to be a porcelain sign, I wouldn't have faded it like I did. I would have left it relatively the way it was. Uh, the, the old metal signs, usually it was a porcelain that was baked on. They didn't fade that much, and uh, they would stay fairly bright and fairly glossy for decades. Uh, you can do this a couple of different ways if you're doing a porcelain sign. If it's going to be mounted directly to the wall and you can't see behind it, you can use a really thin piece of wood. You can use a piece of that plywood like I was talking about before. Um, I have my own wood shop, as you all know, and I was stripping, I was uh, peeling off some really fine strips off some stuff that I've gotten the measurement just a little bit wide. And I've got a stack of these things about an inch tall, and these aren't even a 64 thick. So I've saved them all and stuck them in my model railroad box for just such emergencies. Uh, but I can take this and glue it down to that. And which is what I did on most of these signs around here that look like they're just glued on. And uh, you can make your sign that way. If your sign's going to hang on a post and there's a way to see behind it, those signs were metal on the back. Take this and glue it to the shiny side of a piece of tin foil. Once it's good and dry, cut it out, and then you can mount that to the building and that will give you a dull silvery finish on the back side of the sign. If you have the sign and you want it to look like somebody's hit it and one end's bent up, uh, then you can take it, just bend the, bend the tinfoil and it'll hold its edge. If you want to throw one out back because it's an old sign and they took it off the building because the guy quit paying them for the advertising space and Junior's been out there plinking at it with a BB gun, uh, you can add little spots to it to make the porcelain look like it's popped off. If somebody's hit it with something and they've got it all bent, you can fold it up, you can rust the back of it, whatever you want to do. But the, the, the uh, uh, tinfoil works out really nice for that. Now for this one, I've got a piece of some clapboard siding here. And as we've talked about in our uh, uh, scratch building clinics, first thing you always want to do is, 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 is grab your thumbnail, slide it down those clapboards, and figure out which way is up. And label that on the back of the siding. I hadn't done that yet. So we're going to take this and we're going to put it up here just as a demo piece 
and I want this to look like it's actually painted on. Now, with such a small sign, this is going to go relatively quickly, I hope. Um, what I do with it is I take some sandpaper. You can use pretty much whatever grit you want. I personally like this 180, or I grab a, uh, an emery board and get these over at uh, Sally Beauty Supply or wherever you've got it, whatever your local beauty supply is. They sell these in all kinds of grits, everything from about 80 grit coarse all the way up to several thousand for polishing and everything. They're not that expensive. When you walk in there, the lady behind the counter is probably going to give you an odd look uh, and tell her what you're looking for and go ahead and own up to it up front that you're a model railroader and you know, that she quits looking at you like you're getting ready for a drag show or something. And uh, you can use sanding sponges, you can use sanding paper, whichever way you want to go. Um, but I've really found that uh, these emery boards are really nice. Now, one of the tricks here, and I want to make sure I'm, yeah, there we go, thanks, sir, is you want to work from the middle out. If you start doing this, you're going to catch, it's going to wrinkle the sign up, you're done. So you want to work from the middle out, and you just want to start sanding it. And you're going to create a nice little pile of lint here. And the idea is you want to start sanding until you can see the ink starting to show through. The thinner you can get it, the better. Now, another tip in this, instead of using uh, printer paper, and I got this from the late, great Leo Paletti, is print it on rice paper. And then you don't have to sand it. Now, this one, it's a little hard to see it, but I am starting to get the ink showing through. But I've also managed to wear out that little edge right there. So part of it is going to be missing from the building. And that's fine too. It's peeled off. You print on wax paper using a laser, doesn't the wax? Rice paper. Oh, rice paper. Yeah. So I had difficulty getting it. <laughs> I played drums and guitars in a hard rock and heavy metal band for about six years. So I'm I'm listening to all y'all through constantly. Yeah, because, you know, I was in high school and college and six feet tall and bulletproof. And the guy in his 50s who told me, hey, kid, if you want to hear, you might want to put some earplugs in. And I kind of went, yeah, right. He was right. It's all those things you learn as you grow up. You start getting older and you realize, you know what? Dad was right. I wouldn't have admitted it at the time, but Dad was right. Okay. Now, as you start sanding, like I say, you're going to see the paper, it shows through the paper. I don't know if we're picking that up on the camera or not. It's a little hard to see it. But, uh, yeah. And I've got a little hole there where I got a little bit uh, carried away, but that's okay too, because this will work out nice. Now, yep, that's right. All right. So, y'all have seen me use the Aileen's Tacky Glue and on the bottom of a shot glass. Nothing surprising there. And that's a waste of good bourbon. And if he'd spilled Scott, uh, Irish whiskey, then it'd be fighting words because that's a that's just a crime shame right there. Like that might be a felony in some places in Ireland. So I'm going to take it and I'm going to paint a really thin layer of this on the back side of the paper here. And you do have to work relatively quickly because this stuff will set up pretty quick. So you want to find the top of a clapboard and use that as an alignment guide. And then start just literally pressing it in with your hands, with your thumb there. You can come back in with a burnisher of some sort. I'm using my negative tweezers. As you guys know, I preach the value of negative tweezers all the time. And I'm just using the back side of those. Put a little pressure on it and work it down into all the grooves. Ta-da! Now, if you want to fade this in a little more, we can certainly do that. Just 
Go back in and You can get a few streaks or anything like that that you might want. Boom. Nice and simple. You can. I have seen guys do this where they'll take and start layering up dull coat. And I mean layering it up. Lots and lots of coats of it. And then take that and soak it. And actually, the ink will stay on the back side of the dull coat, and the paper will then wash away, and then you can put it down like a decal. I know some guys down in Houston that I learned that one from who get some fantastic results out of it. I have had next to no luck making that work at all. <laughs> so I do it this way. Um, yeah, Tracy's always accused me of stealing a lot of things from him in good nature. Uh, that's not one of them. <laughs> um, you can use anything to mount signs to. I mean, this is a piece of Strathmore board that I've cut out. Actually, that's a window cut out of a mock-up for a, a new kit I'm working on. Uh, it's a little thick for me to be making signs, but you could certainly do it. Um, I took the, uh, the Hugh Springs feeds sign, uh, that sheet you saw passing around, and all I did was I cut the thing out and I glued it to a piece of this really thin wood and literally just cut the thing out with my scissors. And then for the sign itself, I took some strip wood and I figured I, I took the board, I took the building and I laid it down on a piece of paper. In fact, it was another bottom of this actually. And put a little line following the roof pitch. So I knew what the pitch of the roof was. And then I used that to figure out what angles I wanted for the sign. And then I knew what angles to cut on my strip wood and then stood the sign up glued the angles to it and popped it on. So there's a lot of different ways you can go about making these things. And it, like I say, if you start looking around online for these things, have, have a whole day where you got nothing to do or set a timer on your phone. If you've got something important, you don't want to miss the big game or whatever, uh, cause you will end up in the middle of this and you're going to find that hours have gone by and you saved off all kinds of, excuse me, signs for all sorts of things. Um, some of the things when you start scaling them down kind of get muddy. I mean, for example, these little things down here, uh, that's a, that is a uh, Sports Illustrated from the summer of 56 or 57, something like that. That is another magazine, I think Look Magazine or Time. I think it's Time Magazine. <laughs> this one, no, this one's Time. I can tell by the little red corner. That one's Sports Illustrated. That's a calendar. I've got better calendars. This is one actually I had done up in Corel. It's got a pinup on the top of it. And by the time you shrink it down though, even the little hairlines are a little too wide. So it kind of gets muddy down here. But if you can find old calendars online and that's another thing that people like to buy and sell and trade and all that, uh, you can find calendars out there uh, for whatever dates you want. Uh, if you've got something like PowerPoint uh, or if something fancier from a graphics package standpoint, you can just go out into Yahoo or Google and type September 1957 and poof, it's going to pop up all sorts of different calendars and the dates are right. You can just go in there and grab the calendar portion of it, which is about all it's going to have. Drop that into PowerPoint or Corel or Photoshop, and then go grab your favorite pinup beer commercial car or whatever and slap it on the top of it. Combine the two pieces together and then shrink it down to whatever scale size you want. You print it off and hang it on the wall of the shop. Done that on several different models. Uh, when you're working in a garage, a pinup poster is almost a given back in the day. Uh, Champion spark plugs, uh, Ford V8s, uh, Chevy, Mopar, you know, insert favorite flavor of automotive uh, motors and parts and things, um, different parts companies, things to that effect. They would all give you signs and posters and things like that, and the guys would hang them up in the shop. Uh, so having those all over the walls and all over lockers and whatever else is a great way to add a little bit of interest into your uh, into your models. The uh, when the clinic started originally, I had that one white two story building that had all the signs on the outside. If you go back and look on our website and look into the building and some of the night shots, there's signs all the way down the walls and back up in the bottom level. That is the Womack Mercantile. So it's basically a general store grocery store kind of thing. And all those signs that you saw before for the grocery store and many, many others, 
I mean, green giant vegetables, things like that is all around the inside of that building. So there's all sorts of things you can do with it. Um, I've recently started going in. I wanted some striped paper uh, to go in. I wanted to make an awning for a building that I was working on and uh, couldn't find anything that I liked for the longest time. And then I got lucky in the last place I stopped and I found some scrapbooking paper that had the stripes about where I wanted them. And I brought that home, was able to use it. Uh, but some of those scrapbooking papers, if you buy those, I mean, they'll have some that look like, you know, red marble. Okay, great. Take that, bring it in, shrink it down in Photoshop and print it off in tiles. And you use it for making flooring, uh, awnings, all your signs. It doesn't have to be stone flooring either. It could be wood flooring. Um, my dad called when I was working on that same building, that same mercantile building. I was working on the upstairs and dad calls me one day and he says, uh, so what you up to? I said, trying to figure out how much wallpaper I'm going to need for this room. Now, mom and dad have hung wallpaper in every house we've ever owned. And dad can sit there and tell you, you tell him how long this wall is and how long that wall is. He can tell you how many bolts of wallpaper you need for the room. And I says, oh, well, how big is the room you're working on? I said, about three and a half inches that way and about two and three quarters this way. And he stopped, he goes, you're wallpapering a room? And I went, yeah, on a model. I went, yeah. He goes, must be for the contest room. I said, oddly enough, no, but I'm building it like it is. Um, but I literally found a piece of scrapbooking paper that had this little narrow stripe in it, and it was almost perfect. I didn't have to scale it at all, and I just took the paper, scanned it in, and then cut out the part of it that I didn't want, repeated the stripe over several times, printed it off on eight and a half by 11 sheets, and literally cut the thing out and glued it on just like you would hang wallpaper in the room. Um, used it for making bedspreads for the bed. Um, I used it to make subway tile for the bathroom. They had a wainscot of, scrap, of subway tile around the, around the bathroom. Uh, stuff like this, you can use it for all sorts of different things. I know guys that use paper for their streets. Art Cunningham up in uh, Prosper area, he actually has a really nice speckled gray kind of paper that he uses for his streets, and they look fantastic. Um, I know some guys that have used them for their sidewalks. They've drawn it up here and printed them up with all the cracks and expansion cracks and everything else, put manhole covers in and everything, else, printed them off, cut them out, glued them on some styrene, they're done. I mean, there, it's, it's one of those things where if you start thinking about it, you know, the sky's the limit. It's not just signs. You can do an awful lot of neat stuff with it, but the process is the same. Come up with your artwork, print it off, cut it out, mount it. Any well, questions? I got a question. Canopy glue <clears throat> compared to A-Lames, is that about the same thing in your mind? To me, it is the exact same thing. The difference is, is I bought that bottle right there for $2.99 and a bottle that big of canopy glue will cost you 10 or 12 bucks. Okay. This I can buy at Walmart at three o'clock in the morning if I'm having a bout of insomnia and decide I want to build a model and I can't find any glue, I can make a run to Wally World and I can go buy me a great big bottle of glue. I felt like that they both felt like they were the same thing, but I didn't. Know. They do to me. Uh, and they're my, I mean, and somebody watching this will probably say there is. I think Jeff, I just heard him chime in to say something there's different with it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And they both dry clear. Uh, they both have a really good tack to them. Um, I've never tried gluing a canopy into an aircraft with this, but I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work. Well, I'm just thinking Most in terms of something clear. Yeah, yeah. There's. Uh, used it. Oh yeah, kin kin like canopy glue. Um, um, Leo liked the pink flamingo glue that Northeastern sells. I've not used it. Uh, it dries clear as well. Uh, but I know some. I know him and several other guys that swear by it. Yeah, as, as long but, as it will stick and dry clear, that's all. That's and all. dry quickly. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, so many times, I mean, a lot of us, we, we joke and we kid each other about, well, yeah, how long did it take you to build that? I, I did that mostly over one weekend, mostly in one afternoon, truth be told, because the windows and the doors are stuff I had out of other kits and things that I had laser cut before. So all I had to do is go in and cut the openings and, and I had extras laying on my bench. Um, and I know guys that would take months to build a building that size. And I, for me, if that's going to take me months to build, I've already built half a dozen other things since then. I mean, it's to me, it's it's if the if you've got to let it dry overnight, you're using the wrong glue. <laughs> have you Quite found, honestly, have you found something that works like dull coat, but is not testers dull coat? Uh, Tamaya makes a dull coat that works pretty well. Uh, uh, Vallejo makes flat varnish. 
And I like that one a lot because you can either airbrush that out or I can get it right out of the bottle yeah. and uh, and get in there with a paintbrush and just hit one little spot if I need to. Well, the reason why I ask, I'm, I'm using some testers dull coat right now and it's got, a, it's got a sheen to it that I've not seen before. So I think they've got the can mislabeled and I was going to try a different brand. Possibility. <laughs> uh, the thing you got to be real careful about when you're shooting rattle cans or even airbrushing uh, is what's the humidity that day. If there's a lot of humidity in the air, you can trap moisture underneath the paint and it'll do what they call blushing. Mm -hmm. And you'll end up with a bit of a white cast underneath it. Yeah. And, uh, and that's- I'm not getting that, it's more of a- It's just you get it more gloss more than you want. sheen that I don't, that I don't want. Okay. Uh, next time they, you got the store and they ask you paper or plastic, you tell them paper. Yeah. Take, take the grocery sack home, unload the groceries, take it out to the shop, cut you off a little piece of it, and go in there and take that, paper sack and rub it around on there and see if that doesn't take the sheen off of it. Okay. Uh, I had a cousin who for a while was doing cabinet work and they'd come in and spray a set of cabinets down. He goes, anything that I have that's a matte finish, he goes, I actually spray, I buy gloss, period. I said, what happens if they want it without that much sheen? He goes, I rub it down with a brown paper bag. No kidding, okay. But it takes the shine right off of it. Uh, all right, good. He goes, I don't, have to, I don't have to buy multiple types of paint that way, or in this case, clear coat. Somebody over here had a question? What, you say again, what grit sandpaper you use to sand it and or what is there on those uh, emery boards? Do they have a grit mark? Yes, on? they do. Uh, this was one, it's, it's 100 on one side and, and 180 on the other. I was using 180. Uh, 220 is another fan favorite. And I mean, even pieces like this that look like they're actually completely, uh, this probably should have been thrown out years ago. It still has <laughs> enough on it to, uh, to still be usable for stuff like this because you don't want anything overly aggressive but you don't want it so fine that you're over there working on it for hours on end. I mean, <laughs> if, if the wife fires up Titanic and by the time Jack's slipping off the headboard and dying and you're still sanding on this, throw it away and get something else. Um, but yeah, I, I find 180 tends to do for, for at least taking the paper off the back. It's just aggressive enough, but not enough to get stupid, you know? Um, and these Emory boards, the, like this one right here is four different grits. It does not say what it is. It says, uh, number one, file nail edge. Judging by the other ones I own, that's probably about a 220. Remove ridges is number two. Again, doesn't say what it is, but it's infinitely finer. Number three is smooth surface, and number four is super shine. Um, these are all polishing ones. Uh, these are also good if you want to come in here and, um, let's try this one. And, no, it's that, and it's made a big muddy mess of it, never mind. Um, <laughs> You can take it sometimes and you can take, kind of knock the sheen off of it a little bit with one of the higher grits. But uh, this one right here that I'm working with says it's washable, disinfectable, 703, uh, 303 is a part number. It's just coarse and then it says 100 and 180. So one, one's on one side, one's on the other. Most of the ones they sell at Sally's are like that. Uh, all of these that I've got, and I've got another five or six types in the toolbox down here, uh, all came from Sally's. They're... 253 bucks a piece, maybe something like that. Um, when you go over to Walmart, you buy them over there, it just says Ember Board. And it's got one on one side and one on the other, and God only knows which one's which. Um, but yeah, that, that's one of the reasons why I like these. I've got a set of these that I keep in my toolbox. I got a set of these that I keep in my workbench. I have a set of these that I keep out in my wood shop because if I'm working on a harp or I've got a guitar and I'm trying to work inside of a, the horn on a Stratocaster or something like that, <clears throat> especially if I'm trying to really work through a compound curve or something, these things are invaluable. Uh, I know this has not happened to you at all, but you mentioned that somebody building the model may have gotten a drop of glue out on it. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's happened to me more times than I can count. <laughs> I was trying to be nice, but anyway, even though you put me on the water coaster. Uh, but, but how, how do you fix that? Okay, um, that guy right there, if I'm still on the screen. Yeah, we will be. That guy right there. The back side of it right there makes a really nice little scraper. Now, if you're working with Aileen's or canopy glue, you can come in here and let's say I got a little bit of glue up in here. I can come in on the back side of this and turn it so the sharp edge is up and then just come in here and use it like a card scraper and just scrape it back off. Most of the time it'll peel it right up. And that goes for window glass too. 
if I'm gluing the, you know, like using that Duralar material for my window glass, I'll get it glued in there. And if I've got a little bit of that and squeeze out, I'll set the window back down and hold it either with a pair of negative tweezers in place, or I'll hold it on the rest of the frame where I'm not touching the glass. And then I'll come back in here with that back edge again, and I'll just very lightly scrape that glue and it'll come right up. Now, if you get, if you're using carpenter's glue, this may not work. I mean, you may end up having to get in there with some sandpaper or something like that or an emery board and literally sand it back off. Um, any glue that you get that has some squeeze out, try to, uh, to uh, deal with it immediately. Um, you can come in with a uh, little wet uh, Q-tip and can get some of it off of there. You can get a paper towel wet. You can come in there and get part of it off of there, especially if you're working with uh, carpenter's glue. Uh, you'll have some wood woodworkers will argue, oh, you're going to get water in there. It's going to weaken the glue surface. And, 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 and. I'm like, dude, I've, I've got harps I'm building with several thousands of pounds of pressure on the, from the strings trying to pull the whole thing over. I've yet to have a glue joint fail because I wiped it down with water. Uh, the advantage being, and the one thing you never, ever want to do is go, oh, it's a little bit of squeeze out and wipe it off with your finger. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. If you're going to come back in and use stains to weather it, you're now going to have a great big spot that's going to stick out like a sore thumb because you sealed the grain of the wood when you wiped that off with your finger. It's like doing, it's like doing hydrocal mountains. You try to get one in there and you get a little bit of a run, you reach over there and wipe that thing smooth with your finger, it will not take stain the same way as the rest of the rocks wheel because you just sealed over all those little open pores. Yeah, that too. So um, wash it off, scrape it off. Um, I, depending on where I am and what I'm doing, I'll either wash it off or I will let it start to tack up and then I'll come back in with a scalpel or a pair of negative tweezers and I'll come back in and pick at it and grab a hold of it and lift it back out. It'll be just tacky enough that I can work with it and not really a liquid, but it's not dry yet, so I can still work with it that way. Uh, and typically on a model, that's the way I will go with it because I am dealing with a very small glue surface that's right on the inside of that, and I could get some water in that and then weaken the joint. So, now fortunately, now, something like this is, is not under stress. Is a variety of dental tools. Yes. And they, I work got some that I know where I got them, but. They're, they're perfect for removing. Uh, yeah, um, if you glue. if you get them, uh, let's see. Now that Jane has passed, she's yeah, reading. Yeah, she's renamed it uh, Route sixty six tools. Um, didn't have a lot of selection at the show this year, but normally uh, there's a lot of picks there that you can get. Uh, you can actually buy a few picks over at uh, Walgreens and CVS for people crazy enough to want to try to clean their own teeth. Um, <laughs> Micromark sells some, but quite honestly. Hit up your dentist. Hit up yeah. your dentist. Uh, talk, dentist. Talk real nice. They break them and then yep. they're glad. Yep. To yep. Talk to your dental hygienist. And and again, this is one of those where owning up to your sins is a good thing. If you go in and you tell them up front, she goes, okay, so here's the thing. I build model trains and I was wondering, what do you do with the old dental picks once you're done with them? She goes, what do you use them for? I'll use them for carving the rocks and scenery and stuff like that. I use them as burnishers and this. And you start rattling off all this. She goes, oh. Well, hang tight a second and she'll come back with a bag full of them that they've already run through the autoclave and they're perfectly sterile. Um, so I, while I was working on, I had a, had a piece up here he was working on here about a year and a half ago and I've started to run short on them again. So I asked, said, uh, so I got a question for you. He says, yeah, I said, what do you do with all your old burrs after you're done drilling people's teeth? He goes, well, once they get dull, he said, uh, we had one guy that used to build model ships so we kept, kept them from him for the longest time, but we haven't seen him in a while. I said, well, the reason I'm asking is I build model trains. And she goes, I'll be right back. And she came over with a bag, little it's paper on one side, clear on the other. It's about that wide. And I think there was a pile of dental burrs and polishing things about that tall in it. I've got more burrs now that I'm probably going to need maybe for the rest of my life. Who knows? But uh, but yeah, uh, make nice with your dentist. Same thing for like oh, yeah, because they'll rip that thing open, make one cut with them, throw them on the floor, and then they're heading for the trash. Uh, I've got an aunt that just recently retired, but uh, sorry, an aunt who just recently retired, as my friend from New England likes to remind me, an aunt is something that crawls on the ground and spoils picnics. And at which point I told her, oh, you know my Aunt Glenda. Um, but um, yeah, she she would grab those tweezers, things like that. You know, it's a one use kind of thing. And yep, clean them up and away you go. And, and a lot of times if they pull out a 
surgical pack. Whatever doesn't get used is still in the bag and never even been used, but because they opened the whole pack, the rest of it's going out too. <laughs> Just like okay, that. Dwayne, anything, anything else? Not unless there's any other questions, I'm okay. good. Uh, one last announcement, uh, Cole, you want to talk about next month's meeting, please? We will be doing a uh, Arduino clinic. Um, I apologize to these people, people that I set up that had the wrong date. So, uh, I apologize to the people that I sent an email out to that have the wrong date, but it will be next month. Uh, we still would like more people to sign up for it. Uh, if you are interested in learning how to program Arduinos, um, see me afterwards and I will get you the link to the kit you need and uh, everything else. Uh, Steve will be putting out information on the division's uh, Discord channel as far as uh, downloading the software and everything for the clinic. So next month if you signed up, bring your laptop. Just to pick up your chairs, starting right here in this corner, just stack them against this wall there and go about five or six high and drive safe going home. Thank you, everyone.